Good morning, everyone. We'll call the regular meeting of the Board of Regents of Del Mar College to order at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, August 10th. Um, due to the continuing uh, emergency declarations by the governor and the attorney general, we are meeting via uh, video and teleconference. Members of the public have been offered an opportunity to uh, view this meeting a live stream as well as uh, via audio. I'm going to um, call a roll for the board. Regent Adami? Here. Regent Averett? Here. Regent Bennett? Here. Regent Garza? Here. Regent Hutchison? Here. Regent Kelly? Here. Dr. Turner is not able to be with us today. Dr. Villarreal? Here. And I'm Carol Scott. We do have a quorum and can conduct business. Would you please join me in a moment of silence? Thank you. Regent Garza, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And please join us in reading the Del Mar College vision statement. Del Mar College will be the premier choice for life-changing educational opportunities provided by responsive, innovative faculty and staff who empower students to improve local and global communities. Thank you. Del Mar College is streaming live audio and video from the official Board of Regents meeting in the college's website in real time with the exception of portions of the meeting considered as closed session by statute. The public was afforded an opportunity to provide public comment, and we do not have anyone registered today for public comment on any of our agenda items. Uh, so I thank you all for joining us a little bit early today. We've got a long agenda, and we thought it would be helpful to start early with some staff reports and get those out of the way. So I'm going to ask Dr. Escamilla to introduce our first staff report, our SAC COC and QEP update, and bring Dr. Christina Wilson up as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Regents, today it's my pleasure to bring to you a, a report that uh, the college has been waiting oh, a little bit more than 10 years for in many ways. Uh, of course, for many of the staff members, the last uh, several years have been especially um, um, uh, essential in, in, in culminating a, a report that really talks about how the college has been operating uh, over the last uh, decade um, as per the um, uh, the accreditation process and and, uh, and as it relates to S Southern Associations of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges SAC COC kind of rolls right off doesn't it Somet sometimes anyway uh, it, it, it's an it's a it's an incredibly important day uh, uh, to, to 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 give this report and uh, we, we we Christina and I were saying we, we would have brought a, a baked a big cake but but given today's circumstances we had to hold off and uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna find ways to to celebrate what's about to be announced again it's a it's a very very big day in the college's uh, tenure in, uh, in the past for the college's past decade and dr christina wilson is here to share the news there we go thank you good morning everyone it's so nice to be able to start today off with some really good news um, today i'll be providing some information on our sac coc activities some of which you've heard about before the last time i provided an update was back in november but i'm really happy to share some good news and also some updates on three major activities one of which is our 10-year reaffirmation the second is our quality enhancement plan, and the third is an upcoming substantive change visit for the new BSN degree and the level change. As Dr. Escamilla said, SAC COC just rolls off the tongue. The Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges is the accrediting body that allows us to offer financial aid to our students and it's really the seal of approval that tells other institutions that our courses 
can be transferable and that we implement um, the highest quality of best practices. This is the regional accrediting body for the southern states and Del Mar College is accredited by SAC COC and we are required every 10 years to undergo the reaffirmation process which we have just completed. Del Mar College was in the reaffirmation class of 2021, but to get to that class and the final decision of what the SACS board um, eventually decided, it really took quite a few years for us to get there. So on your slide, you'll see some of the major activities that we participated in as part of the accreditation. Um, the first on, on the list is our compliance certification. And though it says we submitted in March 2020, I just want to note that preparing for that compliance certification actually took several years. So you may think, oh, you know, accreditation comes every 10 years. It really is a continuous process of making sure that we are, we are up to the standards. So we had our compliance certification submitted. We received um, feedback from an off-site committee review followed by the submission of our quality enhancement plan and then we hosted a virtual on-site visit in October. So I'm going to be talking through some of those details in the next slides. As I mentioned, the compliance certification was really the bulk of this work. There are 74 SACS standards that we have to prove compliance with and what the way we prove compliance is to provide narrative documentation and also many, many evidence items. So this work began in June 2018, and it truly was a college-wide process. We had a SAC steering committee comprised of faculty and staff from all areas of the college to help us to meet our goal of, of submitting our compliance certification. Again, 74 standards. And all told, by the time we submitted, it resulted in almost 10,000 individual items of information, nearly 600 pages of narrative, and 6.5 gigabytes of data. So this was a major undertaking. After the compliance certification is submitted, there is an initial review by an off-site committee. And I've shared this with you already, but it's worth noting again that as part of that review, there was only, out of the 74, one standard that required follow-up. And in talking to our SAC COC vice president, our contact, Dr. Michael Hofer, he has told me there has been no other school in the southern region of, of the United States that have gone through this review with only one area at this stage in the process. So uh, another year of schools has gone by since then and he confirmed uh, one school got close, one school had two areas, but we're the only school to have, um, to have reached that milestone. So something to be very proud of. Following that initial review, we hosted our quote unquote on-site visit, which wasn't on-site, it was virtual. So we were among some of the first colleges and universities to host a fully virtual visit and it went very, very well. This took place in the end of October. The purpose of this visit was, them, was for them to look at our quality enhancement plan, which I'll talk more about in a minute, look at our compliance with federal standards, also visit some of our off-campus instructional sites, many of which are our dual credit high school sites. And finally, look at um, our follow-up report, which is just that one area that they needed additional information on. So it was three days of virtual meetings. Um, though it was virtual, didn't mean it was any less rigorous than an in face-to-face -face, um, visit, meeting with faculty, staff, and our administrators from all over campus, and also members of our board. So I did have the pleasure of sharing with you last November that as part of that off, that on-campus, on-site review, there were zero recommendations for improvement, which means that there is no follow-up as part of our recommendation, which was fantastic news. And I'm happy to add to that information and share with you that the SAC COC Board of Trustees voted in June to reaffirm our accreditation. Dr. Wilson, I realize there is more to your presentation and we will um, we'll move to that shortly, but I do want to take a moment to congratulate Dr. Escamilla, 
the entire college because while there is a steering committee that put this report together, it really is based on the work of our faculty and administrators. It is, uh, it is the document uh, that permeates every aspect of our operations and is the third party entity that is the most important one to us. I'm not saying that, that the state and others aren't important, but, but if we don't have accreditation, then, um, then, then we, can't, we cease to exist. So I, I just, I can't emphasize enough um, the, uh, how proud we are of the work that has been done and uh, what's, what a significant accomplishment this is to, to come through this uh, decennial uh, reaffirmation process with zero recommendations. So I want to give other board members a chance, but please, Dr. Escamilla, just make some comments. And just really quickly, just to give it a little bit more con historical context, when we did, did this in 2011, 10 and 11, <clears throat> our offsite um, review yielded 13 areas to, to polish up. Of course, we did, and we came back to zero. Because there's a lot of minor things in there, and, and uh, anything substantive was, was, was repaired and moved on. So it was a very, very nice. We considered that extremely well done back then as well, and it was. Uh, that, even that was uh, above average. What I recall over the years, I mean, we, we, we see colleges that uh, routinely uh, will, will pull up 20, 25, 30 areas that they're able to come out of and, and, and repair and or come back from and otherwise uh, uh, take care of. So just to give you some kind of scale of what one really means and where we really are. I know you think it's, I know it, it, it is, but just to let you know, 10s, 20s, 30s even, um, one is a, I don't know, uh, in talking to Dr. Hofer um, when he called me uh, and I was in the Chick-fil-A line with my boys, uh, that was tricky, um, and to, to let me know this, he said, uh, he said that, uh, you know, you, you've set the gold standard. You know, he goes, next time, he goes, you, you, you got to shoot for platinum. I'm like, okay, no pressure. So uh, we will, the team will, but I just have to add uh, those comments and, and, and thank you for that opportunity. Madam Chair. I'd like to give uh, other board members, Dr. Uh, Ms. Hutchison. I just want to go a little bit further on what you said. You can't do a stellar report like you all did without having a stellar institution. And so that's why I feel like it really does go down to every single instructor, teacher, aide, everybody here. So well done. Anyone else make a comment? Thanks for letting us pause there. It is a significant <coughs> achievement, and, and we, we wanted to, to note that. And, and although we've, we've known for a while it's not official till it's official. So June 21, it was official. <laughs> it's not official till, it, till it's official. That's right. And um, it, it's very important to take a moment to pause because we will continue. Even though this process has ended, we need to think about how we can continue to improve our processes, not just stay within compliance, but how we can seek to continue to be on the cutting edge. Thank you. Madam Chair, I just yes, have a quick sir. comment to you. So often when you in any entity, when you start working on the items that where you're a little deficient or you have some improvement needed, uh, sometimes the things that you've been doing well start to fall off. So again, kudos to, to the staff, to the faculty for all the work that they've done in, in being able to get us this accreditation going forward. Yes, Thank you. I, I just have to add that uh, Dr. Christina and team are already, as she's saying, that's no small matter. We're already working on next decennial Report. Remember, we'll, we'll, for those who don't know, we'll have to do a five-year midterm mid report. We're already getting ready for that. We're already lining up meetings, getting things going, because that momentum is very useful and great energy uh, that'll make that five-year report that much easier. So uh, hats off to the team for, for moving that ahead so that we don't rest on our laurels and, and uh, you know, lose, lose any significant momentum. Thank you. I'll Thank let you, you continue now, Dr. Wilson. <laughs> I'd also like to provide you with an update on our quality enhancement plan, all otherwise known as a QEP. We are required as part of our reaffirmation process to develop a plan that directly in, impacts student success and it results in a standalone document, about a hundred page document. And what's crucial about this plan is that it be embedded within the activities of what we are doing as a college. It, 
it's not a standalone, let's just put a plan together for the sake of, of checking the box. It, what SAC COC really looks for is to make sure that we've done our homework, to make sure that we found a subject that will greatly impact student success. So that is what we have done with our quality enhancement plan, which we are calling GPS, Goals Plus Planning Equals Success. So after talking to our faculty, our staff, and our students, we realize that the area in which we need to provide the most focus is student academic advising. We offer fantastic programs in a variety of fields, but we realize that we want to get better at providing students with the support that they need to not only choose the major that works for them, but also build their pathway and stay on their path. So on your slide, you will see the five overarching goals of our GPS plan, clarifying career goals following consistent and effective advising practices. We do have a split model of advising where students receive advising from staff and also from faculty, so we wanna ensure consistency. We also want to improve student engagement, make sure that they are having those advising appointments as necessary and required. We also want to strengthen our transfer pathways. We realize that approximately half of our students come to us with the intention to transfer. So we want to make sure that students are on that path early and stay on that path. And finally, our students want information that's accessible 24 7 so we seek to utilize innovative technology to help keep students on the path so these are the overarching goals of our qep but i'd like to mention as well that these activities are ingrained and embedded within our strategic plan and we have also sought funding from external sources. Um, we've talked previously ab about Project Senda, the Title V grant that we applied for at the same time as we were developing our QEP. So I just wanna emphasize that this is not a standalone plan. This is really um, ingrained and embedded into the work that we do as a college, and we're really proud of it. So since this plan has been launched, we've made some very significant milestones. Here are just a few of them. We have offered an advising certification course for our faculty and staff advis advisors to ensure the consistency of information that they have and the consistency of information that they provide to students. So this um, certification course is a two-level program. We've had 71 graduates of level one and 22 graduates of level two. So this is something that we are able to provide thanks to Project Senda, the Title V grant, and we will continue to implement this for the next few years with the hope that the majority of our faculty advisors will undergo tr training. We've also been able to hire several new advisor positions, what we call MAP advisors. We have eight guided pathways areas and we're seeking to ensure that each area has at least one staff advisor to provide service and support. We've also reorganized the way our programs are listed on our website so that out of all of our 100 plus credit programs, students have an organized manner in which to explore related programs as they decide on their major. And related to that topic, we've also purchased a license for MC Career Coach software. I've talked about it in prior presentations. That is really key to helping students explore and evaluate um, what they wanna do in their careers. So those are some of our major project milestones, but we've also made some additional progress in getting our faculty involved on advising committees as well. If, if I may, uh, Dr. Christina, mm -hmm. I, I'd just like to add, Regents, this is a culmination. Uh, this plan, this GPS um, plan that we have uh, for our uh, QEP, all these letters, right, um, is years in the making. This goes back six, seven years. It's just a little bit. Of, it's been an incremental process in so many ways, adding the number of, of advisors, complementing the faculty advising comp model that we have. Um, every one of our faculty members uh, are advisors of sorts. And then, but, but upping the game by training, offering their training, formalizing those things has really bolstered uh, the culture of, of um, reaching our students. And so, this with um, going back to the days when Dr. Janda 
uh, was 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 advocating for embedded advisors out out in the, in the departments, which have made all of it, and really adding <clears throat> a multifaceted approach um, is really having a, a, a deep impact and a deep and it's a broad and deep cultural change here at the college. This instrument, which is our QEP, is going to be able to uh, document, capture that for the first time in a very long time uh, as, it, as, it, as it's culminated. And we'll get to present it um, uh, so certainly to, to, to you all as a board, but uh, this is going to be a, a it'll amount to over a decade's worth of work uh, to shifting that big ship, if you will, that big, um, that big entity, which is our which is our uh, um, college faculty and staff. So I just have to say that from a historical context, how much work has been going in. And even before Dr. Christina was on our team, um, it, it, it went back, but she came through and, and uh, with others and have pulled it all together. So hats off, lots and lots of work on this uh, uh, project and it's taken off in earnest. Thank you. Madam cool. Chairman, I have a quick question. If yes, it's okay. please. Um, I, I love this, so thank you so much for all the work that you all are doing with that. On your goal number four with a transfer pathway, and I was interested when you said uh, about, did, did I hear you correctly, 50% of the students, you know, plan to go on to another university. While you have different universities, you would hope, you know, that many would go on to our university here, you know, in, in our community. Um, do you all have either committees or some type of alignment with the universities to make sure the courses that they're taking here will transfer? Uh, how does that work or how are you all working with that right now? Thank you, Dr. Villarreal. Um, we do, especially with our uh, closest partners, a and Corpus Christi and also a and Kingsville. Mm -hmm. We do have committees that meet and our faculty are also collaborating frequently about what's transferable. Um, the state is doing a lot of work as well to ensure that that improves over time. But I'll tell you uh, what we're seeking to do with this particular plan is um, we do have these relationships, we have these partnerships, but we wanna make sure that students have that right information too. So that's how we're taking it to the next level. Um, we talk about pathways quite a bit and we have articulation agreements, which may not be very student friendly. We want maps for them. So uh, those relationships that you're asking about are definitely in place, but now we're seeking to solidify them so we can give student that that concrete map of what they need to do to transfer. That's something that with our um, K-12 systems, they're really struggling with with early college high schools and with uh, these partnerships. The kids are, are leaving high school with 60 hours and hardly any of them are transferring. So they have all this all these hours, these college hours, but they're not able to utilize them at UT or even here within our own community. So yep. I was really pleased to hear that. Thank yep. you so much. We're You're doing welcome. A lot Thank of, you. A lot, lot of work for that. Just just some round numbers, a little under a thousand. I think it's closer to 900 is a big, is a kind of a big crop of, of students that we would send to A&M Corpus Christi on a full calendar uh, academic year, about 250 a calendar year on average, Kingsville. Um, after that, it's UTSA and the like. Right. And, but A&M and, and UT still have big, very big numbers uh, as well, just kind of round numbers. There are those that plan to transfer, mm -hmm. and then there are those that plan it with, with, with degrees, and then there are many more, uh, many more hundreds of students, hundreds, actually it's several thousand students a year that transfer both with the intent, uh, mm -hmm. with, the, with the, an associate degree, and many with just the bare, with, with, what, the, with what they need. I'll be glad to share more of that with you, but just to kind of give you a ballpark. Of, oh, I think that's wonderful. I was really pleased to see that. Thank you. If I recall, our statistical analysis was something like 1,700 on average students transfer without a degree. That's correct. And they that's transfer, about, yeah. Yep. They, and then they leave us without a degree to transfer somewhere else. That's exactly yeah. right. It's about, yeah. the, I think the big number is about three, on average, about 3,000, 2,800 to 3,000 students a year that are leaving the college one way or another to university. I have two questions related to this. One is, uh, what is the life of the QEP? Is it a five-year plan or a 10-year plan? Mm -hmm. And then the second question is, how do we measure success uh, for the QEP? Oh, yes. Excellent questions. So officially, the QEP is a five-year plan for SAC COC purposes. However, as I mentioned, 
most, if not all of these activities are already embedded within our strategic plan. So I fully intend that at the end of, of the five-year window, we'll look at ways in which we were successful and also ways in which we need to continue to work on these goals and activities. Regarding evaluation, some of these act activities are um, directly aligned with the KPIs within our strategic plan. So those are evaluated on an, at, on an annual basis. Additionally, the QEP has a separate evaluation plan, and right now we are preparing the first year's evaluation plan. That's not something that's required of SAC COC. We only have to report at the end of the fifth year, but because we want to make sure we're making the progress necessary, our QEP director is developing that first year report right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've got a question. Yes, sir. All right. Um, so am I understanding that we've got to negotiate with each four-year institution about which credits will transfer and which will not? Or is there some standard that would be used by all the four-year universities? What you're hitting on is a complicated issue of what will transfer versus mm -hmm. what will apply to okay. the degree plan. Okay. So we, we do offer courses. All of our courses are, um, are standard courses that are approved by the state to transfer. Okay. However, depending on the degree plan a student chooses and what oh, the I university what requires, it may not apply. So we don't want our students transferring with lots of credit that doesn't apply. So that, to, that to does a specific sometimes. degree program. Correct. Got it. Correct. Got it. That's that's where it gets complicated. Just just to add to that, from a legislative standpoint, it is something that is brought up session after session after session, and it is resisted by the big university systems. Um, I've seen it on many many levels. This past week, I've spent a lot of time working with my. Uh, soon to be high school senior applying for universities and so forth and and who has Del Mar College credit so I'm uh, I'm here as dad too saying oh my goodness mm -hmm. so but but I've known this and so that the sooner the challenge is this is that the you know it, it works best when this when a student can identify where he or she wants to go as soon as possible and it has to be more specific not just the university it's the college within the university and then it gets into the department and then you get down to that faculty advisor that really is going to help you or not and so um, um, that's why we have the, those large numbers that uh, chair scott was talking about that, that leave with you know 30 40 hours the the, the, the core uh the 42 43 42, okay, 42 hello it's got to be an uh, even number usually anyway 42 hour core is what the state recognizes as that transferable core truly core um, but even then, um, as I'm hearing, as I'm experiencing, and have been hearing for years, that the, the universities will make you repeat courses, um, even though they've already been taken, even though they're in the core. And, you know, it, it is a huge legislative item, huge. And it is a big, is it a fight? It's, a, it's, a, it's more than a fight, but it's a, it's a big problem. Considering that over 90% of the dual credit courses in the state of Texas are offered by community colleges, it is something that we have been challenged with, um, and there has not yet been a legislative fix, nor has there been a coordinating board regulatory fix. Mm -hmm. We continue to advocate for those, but, but there is a, it, it's, it's a uh, rigor, but it's also a financial oh, yeah. uh, conversation, yeah. and, and they, they, there's a lot of conversation about rigor, uh, and are the courses truly equivalent? But there, what, what doesn't get talked about is the potential loss of revenue for a student who comes into a college already with 40, 45, 60 hours of credit. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a complex and complicated issue. It's, it's a bigger problem with the bigger yeah. universities for sure. Regionals are much more um, cooperative. Mm -hmm. And so we've tended to do it with uh, these articulation agreements with our local universities, but also, for example, with our, the architecture program that has a direct application to Texas Tech architecture program. Mm -hmm. so, so we've also looked at, we've done it at, at a programmatic level uh, to try to provide as much um, possibility for our students as we can. It's not a perfect system by any means. It's a lot of work to do. That's right. Good, good, good question, though. <laughs> Anything else? Yes, sir. Real quickly, uh, looking at goal five, and I'm trying to follow Dr. Villarreal's lead and trying to touch the goal with some of the progress milestones. 
on the, on the following slide. Uh, yes. Utilizing a, a innovative technology. In terms of the implementation of the MC career coach, is that you're considering that an innovative technology? Is that a software program? It program is a software or? program, and that's just a piece of that one goal. Um, you've heard, as part of other discussions, the fact that we are implementing a new ERP anthology, mm -hmm. and there is a very robust student advising platform within anthology that will help students see where they're going on their path, where they are, and also classes they need and those that they don't. So that's also part of that goal. But when it comes to MC Career Coach, that is an innovative technology in that it's accessible to students at any time. Um, students can take either a short or a long assessment, and then based on their results, those results are linked directly to our college catalog. So it says, you know, they'll get the results and say, these are the five areas you may be interested in. Here's what Del Mar College offers. So it's a, it's a very beautiful program that we just launched a couple of months ago, and we're going to um, have a more student-focused launch of that very soon. Okay, now, you've got students the younger students, I'm going to say, that are very computer savvy, they can manu manipulate, maneuver, maneuver through a website and be able to find the links they need in order to be able to, to get full utilization of Pathways or the MC. Then you've got older students that are coming back from, say, for instance, a career that is no longer as viable as it was when they first entered the workplace, and they need retraining or they need schooling so that they can get prepare themselves for a second career. Um, do you have a program or do you have some strategy for being able to help the older students be able to, to, to maneuver or to find their way through these tools? Yes, I believe that we do. Um, part of what makes these tools so handy is that students can access them anytime if they want to. But as you, as you mentioned, not everybody feels as comfortable with mm -hmm. technology to be able to access them. So that's where the required meetings with the advisor comes in. So those um, traditionally are face-to-face. -face. Now we do virtual appointments as well, but we still offer face-to-face -face appointments. But it's helping students know where things are, walking them uh, mm -hmm. through that, um, not just in our advising sessions, but also in our student orientations. So that's where our faculty and staff come in to provide support to students who need it. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. One more piece I'd like to share an update on, and that's our substantive change visit. At around the time that we were submitting our compliance certification in March 2020, we also submitted a substantive change to proposal in order to offer a BSN degree, our first uh, bachelor's level degree. So before we were able to submit that proposal, we came to the board and, and received your approval. We went to the coordinating board, Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, as well as the Department of Nursing to, uh, to get approval. So we learned in September that we were approved to offer the BSN which um, was a significant milestone. And also along with, um, with offering a baccalaureate degree, that means we are a level two baccalaureate degree granting institution. However, even though we received approval, this process is not over yet. We need to host a site visit, a face-to-face -face site visit to ensure that what we provided is actually what's, what's happening um, on the ground. So this will be another virtual visit that we host this fall. It'll be in November, and the visit will focus on the BSN program, the students' experiences, how we are teaching, how students are learning, and also our facilities and resources. So it'll focus specifically on our readiness and the students' experience of the BSN. So though our reaffirmation is complete, there's always work that we are continuing to, to do to ensure that we are continuing to grow and implementing best practices. So I, I anticipate anticipate that after this visit we'll provide you with an update, but we feel very positively about um, what the outcome will be. Questions? And that's it. That's my update. Thank you for your time. Happy to share good news with you this morning. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Next, we're going to receive an update on our DMC Police Department. Uh, Dr. Escamudi has some introductory comments while Ms. McDonald Sure. And Ms. White, come up. Yeah, absolutely. Just, just uh, quickly, some uh, again, some good news 
Um, very good news uh, to share with you today uh, regarding an, an, an increasingly important um, aspect of our of our uh, security safety and security processes here uh, nowadays uh, when, when the word police comes up you, you, you think primarily of security or folks tend to think primarily that there's so many many things uh, that, that, that come with this and I'm, I'm pleased to, 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 to say that Ms. McDonald and and Lauren White um, um, have some um, really fantastic news. Ms. McGann, McDonald. Thank you. Thank you. Today, Chief White and I were going to present to you a timeline and next steps for the um, Del Mar College Police Department. So as we had previously had updated the board in the spring that we were going to submit our application to the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement, which we call TCOL. So that submission was received um, and made to TICO on June the 4th. On July the 15th, we had a TICO site visit. So a rep from the state agency came, and, and I will add that typically they are scheduled. Uh, this particular rep was, happened to be in the area and called that morning to Chief White and said, hey, I'm down near, you know, near Corpus. Do you think I can come by this afternoon? And so, of course, Lauren calls. I said, well, yes, we sure don't want us to tell them no. So we said, sure, come on over. So, so Lauren and I, you know, we, we were prepared, but we said, okay, we need to get, get a little bit more organized and prepared. So, so we did that, and they came that afternoon. And basically, as part of your submission, um, they also want to see you do have the facilities and you do have certain things like a checklist. So um, look that over, and it, the visit went very well. Um, he said that our, our submission, along with all of our supporting documents, was just great. He had absolutely no questions about any of our documents we submitted and said that we would be hearing from them the following week. So that was true. On July the 15th, we received our assignment of a law enforcement agency number from TCO. So as Dr. Escamilla likes to say, that's our license to operate. <laughs> um, but there are other, other things that we have to do. And then on July the 22nd, Chief White and I met with the, there's a local field agent for TCO. And so he, he came by to, I know that, that Chief White knew him, but to introduce himself to me and had a conversation about some next steps and some some support services, I guess you could say, because use, use him as a resource for us as we move along through our process. <laughs> We will be all. temporarily recessing the meeting for a uh, fire alert, so we will reconvene shortly. If we can all proceed out this way and take the doors to the left, and we can just wait out there. The board has reconvened from our uh, brief recess. It is 11.41 a.m. Please continue, Ms. McDonald. Thank you. So on July the 22nd, like I said, we had our regional uh, resource, our regional rep from TICO come by to introduce himself and to help us with some next steps and also just to let us know that, that they can serve as a resource as we move forward with the process. Um, the the TCO number, basically our license to move, it's a license to move forward. It gives us that number that we need because there are many other steps we have to take. And the, the next timeline, I'm going to let Chief White go over. Um, but here's my disclaimer. It's contingent upon the next steps happening and progressing the way we anticipate. Because, of course, as we know, as things have to go through processes with other local or state agencies, it might take a little longer than we, th we think. But this is, this is what we anticipate. So, Chief White. Thank you. Um, so, in the month of August, uh, September and October, we're finalizing our MOUs with the city um, in two different areas. One is the Metrocom. And then the other one is also with the overlapping jurisdiction. And then we're also um, in contact with the Nueces County in reference to um, jail provisions if we needed them. Um, we're also applying for our ORI number with the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety. Um, this is a requirement uh, mandated uh, that we have this so that we can have um, the ability to do uh, records checks and um, the uh, criminal histories as well, okay? And then the last part of it is that we are working on our um, 
operational plan, um, the hours of operation that we are envisioning, how we will uh, uh, structure the schedule for the officers that we hire, um, and uh, also putting them through the hiring process. Um, there is a long list of items that we have to do for each officer as we get prepared to hire them under our number, our agency number. I've got a and question. Okay, go ahead. How, how are we training the new officers? So everyone that will be coming on our department will need to already be, um, to start off with, they will already be licensed law enforcement officers. They'll have to be at a certain level. Um, mm -hmm. And then as we grow, then we can consider hiring officers that do not have as much time on so that you can have like the field training. But there is a requirement that we do like an orientation with every officer that comes on and that will be through um, the chief's office to start off with um, where they will be given an orientation about the campuses and what we will expect of them. Okay. okay. Can I ask yes, you? absolutely. Awesome question. How many officers do you anticipate recruiting? So initially? starting initially eight eight is and the how, number so that we how many would be on duty <laughs> so, yeah. i'm going to defer that to to um okay i know sometimes we don't get into details about got it. how many and where are the hours that one got too far got because it. it would be a security issue so i'm i'm, I'm just want to defer to our council was a to test. see if they might yeah. get into <laughs> that area <laughs> so, so, right? uh, first i asked lots of tests today staff, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah she yeah. just asked about the number Yep. Yeah, and, 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 and eight, the, but as far as like where so and how many per shift. Enough. Yeah, that's yeah enough. but, but, but what, what, we, yeah. what we do talk about, because we do promote, is that at any given point uh, that we have uh, at least, we, we always shoot, excuse me, pardon me, pardon me, strive for um, at least uh, two uh, fully uniformed uh, Corpus Christi Police Departments at each campus. We up those numbers sometime back. Do we always maintain those? It, 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 it varies. But that's always that's our, our, okay, our, that our, helps. Yes. Other questions for Chief White and for Ms. McDonald? And the, the one extra thing is just January of 2022, uh, that's, that's what we anticipate is what we consider activate police department. So that, that's, that's our anticipated timeline is uh, to activate in January of 2022. Super. Thank you both very much. Congratulations on reaching this accomplishment and Go get them. <laughs> this has been a long time coming, hasn't it, mm -hmm. Chief White? <laughs> yes, yes, it has. Yes. Thank you all. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you for the support from the board. And, and Augie was, was a great help. And, of course, Dr. Estevia. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is our uh, final budget workshop uh, or update for uh, this, this cycle. Uh, it, it's a never-ending cycle because as soon as we <laughs> adopt one budget, we... <laughs> <laughs> start working on the next one. I know, uh, Mr. Garcia, but uh, I know you've got a couple of updates for us in today's uh, presentation. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Mr. President, and members of the board. Uh, wanted to, to uh, kick off the presentation with a, a brief uh, recap of, uh, of the July 27 proposed uh, budget workshop. Uh, Dr. Christina Wilson presented the six strategic goals in our Aspire, uh, Engage, Achieve strategic plan, which helps guide the college's priorities, financial, financial and, and people resources. She also described the annual tactical unit plans, which are the college's tools to stay on point uh, with the strategic vision, and they are framed around the annual cycle of planning, executing, assessment, and adjustment. Dr. Wilson presented presentation laid the foundation for the rest of the proposed budget workshop uh, presentation. The work, workshop presentation included the college's priorities and related costs for the 2022 planned uh, year, followed by the funding strategies. We also closed the presentation with a five-year forecast based on historical data points with the caveat that the forecast is subject to changes in our operating environment attributed to unforeseeable shifts in strategic priorities, uh, the economic landscape, state regulations, fiscal and monetary policy, and natural disasters or health and safety issues. This past year is a good example of changes in our operating environment, which veered us and every other organization in the, in the nation in a different direction 
from the planned forecast. The upside to this past year is that Del Mar's cultural resilience and adaptability has allowed us to successfully navigate uh, through the pandemic. So today's proposed budget and tax rate update includes slides from the July 27th workshop with a few changes as a result of the recent increase in our HERF Minority Service Institution funding to the tune of $990,000. Our grant award notification from the U.S. Department of Education came in just last week, Tuesday. Based on the HERF compliance requirements and based on the 2022 priorities, the college is proposing changes to the equipment and salary expense relative to what was presented in our last, uh, at our workshop. Uh, a very important note, today's proposed changes uh, did not change, did not change the overall budget propose, proposal of $110,924,158 originally discussed at our workshop. The proposed total budget remains the same. The team will point out these changes later in our expense section of the presentation. So let's get started with the budget plan calendar. So we are now at the tail end of the proposed budget plan process that started back in December 2020, uh, as Ms. Uh, Chair Scott um, mentioned. In accordance with the uh, uh, plan calendar, we will transition into the approval process after today's presentation. This begins with an approved action item for a public notice of the 2022 proposed budget and tax rates. The open meeting for the public is planned for August 24th, followed by the approval, the approval of the 2022 proposed budget and proposed tax rates and tax exemptions. So, uh, transitioning, uh, since March of 2020, the college culture of resilience and adaptability has allowed us to navigate through the proliferation of changes to our operating environment. Our success in navigating through this period is attributed to our culture of planning, executing, assessing, and adjustment, as I mentioned before. To no surprise, the college was informed last week of another HERF minority funding. We are proposing changes, again, to the equipment and salary. Just want to make sure we're emphasizing that. So, Ms. Keyes will first begin the discussion on the expenses with this year's strategic priorities. Thank you, Ms. Keyes. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Uh, for today, uh, the slide before you is an example of the strategic initiatives that are tied to the strategic plan and embedded throughout the budget. Of course, the first that we always look at is to implement uh, academic programs and workforce programs. We're very proud of the bachelor's degree in nursing that has been approved and that's a great example of a, a new item on this year's budget and those students are being enrolled now. Uh, additionally, we have expanded our continuing education programs really throughout the entire region and are approaching 26 different ISDs where those programs are embedded right now through continuing ed and then of course on West and East Campus too. We continue to invest in professional development and growth in our leadership within, the co within our college staff. And uh, as you can see here, we're looking at increasing professional development and travel. Both were cut last year during the budget and uh, depending upon what happens this year too, could be adjusted. We always look to recruit and retain the highest quality professionals in all levels and our faculty and staff. And again, this is where we hope to address the salaries with a salary increase to stay competitive and so that we can continue to attack, attract the most competent people and the best and to keep them. Always we look to expand programming and particularly this year we're looking at expanding on the south side. As we bring on the south side campus, you'll see a variety of items embedded in different cost, cost accounts and expenses to cover that. And then of course it's all tied to the strategic plan goals that are listed there. I think one of the biggest things that we've talked about really for the last 10 years is to how to expand the service area and how do we expand our, our services within the service area as we look at the different counties around us. And one example is the Rancis County Workforce Development Center that's going to come online next spring. 
We are currently working with Aransas County Judge, Commissioner's Court, and uh, the implementation of the programs over in that facility. We anticipate that the construction for the remodeling will be completed in about March of 22, and we hope to move into the building then and uh, offer programs and courses in the summer. We also continue to focus on our uh, Northwest Center and other areas throughout the entire service area. So these are just examples of how we've tied the strategic plan to the many initiatives within the budget. Thank you. Good morning, Regents and Madam Chair. Okay, so this slide gives you the overall uh, with the main categories of our expense budget. And as Raul mentioned, we have not changed the overall increase, but we have made changes on a few of the line items. Tammy will review the salary and expense category. And then the overall, we have made an adjustment to the non-salary categories and you'll see a decrease, overall decrease of the 300 and some odd dollars there. Jackie will give you more details on the non-salary expense items. So now I will turn it over to Tammy to review employee compensation. Thank you, Kathy. As Mr. Garcia mentioned in, in opening remarks, so we did make a few couple of revisions to uh, what we proposed from the workshop to today and the salary components. So today we are, um, oh, sorry, there you go. Moving forward with the, the uh, original recommendation of the one year of experience paid $829, that did not change, for faculty. We're also proposing um, current bases at 50,000. We're proposing a new increase, which would be an extra 2,000, so it would uh, move the faculty base to 52,000 from 50. And then as we've talked before, we provide that anytime we make these changes, it impacts summer pay when full-time teach summer, so we provide you with that dollar amount and then the associated benefits. And then what we're proposing for exempt and non-exempt full-time staff is a 4% increase, whereas we had uh, presented the three. So we're presenting the 4% increase. So we're giving you the associated impact to the budget of um, 545,000 for exempt and then the associated benefits and the non-exempt would be 277,950 with the benefits. So the overall total impact to the budget for uh, compensation and the associated benefits would be the 2.3 million. If no questions, I will go ahead and turn it over to Jackie Landrum to review our MO budget. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Good afternoon. So now we'll go over the expense budget detail and we'll take a look at those categories that we show you on our monthly financials. I did want to remind you that, again, we don't have the South Campus split out on this detail. It is included in the appropriate categories. So for the employee compensation changes with the proposed salary increases that Ms. McDonald just discussed, the net change for the salaries and benefits from what we showed you in our July workshop is $603,064. And just a reminder that our total budget has not changed. It is what we proposed in uh, last July. And that's to fund that 1% and then that addition to the faculty base is that 603. So for faculty salaries and proposed, uh, the proposed change is now 24,070, which will bring our proposed budget up to a little over 34.6 million. For exempt salaries, we are proposing now a $387,298 increase, which will bring that budget up to about 13.3 million. For our exempt salaries that are considered instructional, we are proposing a $786,217 increase, which will bring that to a little over 2.9 million. For our South Campus salaries and benefits, that hasn't changed, that is still the same, so we're proposing the 941,602, which will bring that up to a little over 1.1 million. Our non-exempt salaries, we're proposing a $420,968 increase, which will bring that to a little over 11.6 million. And then our employee benefits, that is a proposed change of $804,774,
which will bring that budget up to a little over 19.9 million. So for our total employee compensation change, it's $3,364,929, which will bring us to a little over 83.6 million. So for our non-salary categories, as mentioned, there's only one category that we have changed, and that's equipment. So we did reallocate that 603,000 that we needed for that additional 1% for the salaries and the faculty base. Um, so the net, the effect of this reallocation is a reduction of $553,728 to our equipment budget. And the reason that we chose this category is because as we've been analyzing the spending over the year for our equipment, as of May, right now we're at 14%. Compared to last year, we had spent 72% of that budget. And that's due to those higher education emergency relief funds that we've received that's covering those technology and equipment items due to COVID. So for our so for our total proposed changes to our expense budget is three million forty seven thousand five hundred and eighteen dollars, which brings us to that one hundred and ten million nine twenty four one fifty nine, which is a two point eight three percent increase compared to fiscal year twenty one budget. Okay, now Ms. Keys and Mr. Johnson will go over the proposed operating revenue budget. Are there any questions about the expense side? Yes, Ms. Ms. Abram. I have a quick question. Obviously, we won't have those HER funds forever. So in the future, how will we cover this increase? Yes, I'm going to let Mr. Garcia answer that. <laughs> yes, so we are, uh, thank you for that question. So, so yeah, you're actually, we, we will not have that HER funding. And so uh, like anything else, we're going to plan and uh, based on what the outcome of the latest and greatest information, um, there could be some additional dollars that can put some dollars back into the equipment fund. Uh, if not, we're gonna, like we typically do have done in the past, uh, there's gonna be a shifting of dollars around just to make it work. Uh, we, we recognize the importance of funding our instructional equipment, and so that's definitely gonna be one of our major priorities as we rethink uh, our funding stream and, and funding needs in the coming years so hopefully that helps in addition to that uh region Averett, what we what we do know in our assumptions is uh that the um two things remain um all three three legs of the, the three primary legs of the stool remain steady going into next year um, our local tax base remains very strong relatively speaking at this point, we're, rel we're, we're using what we're called natural growth without increase in the, in the so forth. And what we understand is that there's still um, several years of growth uh, projected uh, in front of us. And this is kind of the, this is the methodology that we've used um, um, over the years. We can we 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 have been really um, well, we've been fairly good. I'd say really good at actually uh, at, at, at forecasting and looking from year to year with with the exception of 2010. That was a huge anomaly. The other thing is appropriations are locked in for two years, locked in relatively speaking. Again, um, we know that at times um, uh, the state has done clawbacks and those kinds of things, but all things uh, considered, um, that is a very stable uh, source uh, for next year as well. On the other side of the student tuition uh, leg of the uh, first or second, third, however you want to look at it, the uh, leg of the stool, um, we know that we are... Um, we are in the, in the current budget with no increase. And um, again, that I am gonna say early on that we have to review uh, on, a, on a go forth basis um, because we've, we've, we've gone through these things. But, well, so what I'm saying with that is that, that between the three, the, that the, we're extremely conservative um, given um, the outlook and projections into next year. Um, and so um, we think that this, this year is is the probably the most quote ideal uh, year for growth that the, the of, of revenues um, that uh, with regards to the, those three streams that we've experienced in a very long time. Um, that's 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 how we operate year to year. Um, and and Regent Kelly and I were talking about this the other day. Uh, he asked the very same question over the phone, and I said, you know, the other thing too is we do know that each year is different. We do talk to the faculty and staff about that, and uh, we will uh, address the budget um, on an annualized basis. Uh, again, forecasting 
doing everything we can, doing things like we've never done before, looking, uh, we've not done in a very long time, at least since I've been here, uh, looking out into the future, um, we think the variables are very strong despite all the things that are going on. Thank you. I've got a question. Yes, sir. All right. Um, well, the objective, as I'm remembering, is retention and attracting quality faculty. So if we add this 1% to the salary increase, how does that position us um, competitively with the other colleges and universities? So, so currently, and again, I think for many years, I, I think it's been five or six years now that we've been in the top five uh, as it relates to the other, as it compares to the other 50, 49 colleges in the state. And so what this does with the base, uh, increasing the base for faculty, you asked specifically about that group, and specifically to answer that question, 2,000 to the base makes us very competitive, relatively speaking. That base goes all the way across uh, the faculty and bumps the whole group up um, in that regard. So that, in, in, in addition to the uh, number five positioning in the state, um, is a, um, I think, a, a, a very solid assurance that, that uh, uh, we will remain um, that, uh, competitive uh, from that perspective. And that's the faculty answer. And okay. there's another part, but you asked that. Yeah, and if I may add, you know, this year, this biennium funding period, you know, we were very, one of the few very fortunate institutions to uh, get an increase in state funding. There were other institutions that were not very successful, and I'll point that out later on in my presentation. Uh, what that means is we're, we're very fortunate today to give an increase uh, of what we're talking about, right? Not all our institutions uh, are able to do that. So what does that mean? There's probably a downward trend in the overall average in salaries because of that, which again, as, as Mark pointed out, we already, prior to this increase, position position very well relative to our other institutions on, on the compensation component. And it's going to continue on, just a mere fact that we did very well in our state funding this year that's going to allow us to do a little bit more for our employees. I've got a question. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm extremely pleased to see the increase in salary. Have we gotten any feedback from the faculty council on their feelings about the increase? So uh, this, this latest one for proposal uh, has only, what I, the, the, the feedback that I got was up until the 27th. Um, the summer schedules have not, uh, um, um, I have not been in contact with them about the additional piece on the base. I'm, a, I'm, I'm hearing that they've heard about it through various, and, and, and they're hearing about it today. Again, it's proposed, and so what I get to do is, um, given that, miss, that missed opportunity to communicate, and a, an additional base of a thousand will I'm certain will be uh, received um, um, positively um, what I will do after this meeting uh, and probably this week um, is meet with the officers as they have a, a scheduled meeting coming to apprise them of, of, of this opportunity uh, again it, it is a, a proposed today's a staff report nothing's approved um, but uh, that 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 communication still needs to take place I'm typically on top of that one, but this one did, that one got away from me last week. It was a quick turnaround since the 27th. My fault, though. Any other questions? Okay, yes, sir. Dr. Scamia, I know that, of course, making this commitment to the faculty and staff related, and I understand the needs for increasing the salaries in order to keep up with inflation and make sure that the employees can meet their obligations going forward. Um, but it does take away a little flexibility in terms of determining where it is, some areas where we, I'm going to need some additional need some additional resources. Does this budget, looking at the operation, I had seen a line item that had marketing and recruitment, student recruitment. Uh, toward the end of our meeting, we've got a rebranding presentation, and does this budget have numbers in there that are going to absorb or be able to handle the costs associated with the rebranding? So yes, um, I do not want to steal that thunder. No, but I just want to make sure. I just <laughs> sure, make sure that in the answer, numbers. Answer your question. Absolutely, that was factored in, okay. and it is a uh, the rebranding is going to be as as uh, Miss uh, Williams will will talk about will be a multi year okay. uh, approach. Right. Um, but you, you, I think you will uh, you will see that the numbers are, um, are just where we need them to be. 
Okay. And uh, as it relates to that opportunity, because yes, it, it, it's going to take um, some, some dedicated resources for sure. Okay, thank you. Yes. Anything else on this section? Great, we'll continue, Mr. Garcia. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Keyes, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Garcia. Uh, as Dr. Escamilla referred to the three, uh, three legs of the stool, we always look at tuition and fees. And based upon any budget, you have to make some assumptions moving forward as you plan and you make projections. This budget, as was last year's budget actually, when we were facing COVID times, we based it upon the tuition fees uh, based upon enrollment for 2019. And we recognized that last year we were able to, as we dealt with flex fluctuations in enrollment, we were able to balance the budget and to stay within budget. And this budget will do the same this year. As we are facing, we want to recognize that we are facing uh, unprecedented times right now. No one would have projected that we were where we are right now within our own community with COVID right now. So as we just want to put it forward that we recognize that and we recognize that we may be dealing with fluctuations with enrollment. However, as we project enrollment, as it compares to 2019, we're looking at an annualized enrollment period. Last year for 2020, in the middle of COVID, spring semester was one of the highest springs we've ever had in enrollment. Spring semester enrollment was over fall. And so we project that students will continue to enroll, even if we have a fluctuation here in the beginning of the fall semester. We have an eight week term, we have two eight weeks terms in the fall, we have flex enrollment. We fully anticipate that when we annualize enrollment, that the enrollment will be steady and that we will be able to deal with it just like we did last year. And so there are a lot of the assumptions that you're going to see now are based upon that assumption. About eight years ago or more, um, we heard this uh, conversation, this narrative coming through throughout the, the, the country that the spring is the new fall for commu many commuter community college students, commuter community college students. <laughs> Um, and that the spring is the new fall because it, they, uh, there was this kind of this phenomenon where we, we thought we were unique and that uh, our spring enrollments were overrunning our, our fall enrollments. And that is like, that has traditionally rarely, if ever, been the case. But that has been the case more often over the last 10 years. And as I'm talking to my colleagues around the, the, uh, the country, uh, the, the idea, the notion is that from, from a student standpoint, you know, they start the year their year starts in January. You know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a calendar year. And, and as it relates to uh, the commuter students, um, this has been more and more the case. So um, I think it's, uh, and then add to it, you know, the, 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 the timing of, of this past uh, year and a half now, um, the complexities that, 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 that COVID is bringing, I think is, is really pushing uh, those numbers. And I think um, that na national narrative um, is something that we're going to be watching very closely to bring back to you. Thank you very much. And now I believe John Johnson, is he online? He's online now. John? Thank you, Lenore. Uh -huh. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Yes. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, let me first go over the revenue assumptions um, that we put together. The budget was prepared using the following revenue assumptions. Tuition and fees were budgeted at annualized enrollment 2019 fiscal year levels. In addition, student tuition and fees were, uh, were not increased. At present, 2021 one and two combined enrollments are 9% higher than those reported in 2019. Although this increase cannot be an exact indicator of future enrollments, the college position remains positive. Should enrollments not meet our expectations, any losses sustained by the college can be reimbursed through the HERF, through HERF grant funding. Let me go on to property taxes. Um, the property tax assumptions include the following, maintaining the same maintenance and operation tax rate which we were able to accomplish. We assumed a 3% net taxable market valuation growth. At um, certification, it was actually 3.27. 
Um, we estimated $300 million in new construction. Um, the last report I received, which should be certified, showed a $304 million increase in, in new construction. And the, the last assumption was we wanted to lower the overall property tax rate. At present, the rate that we are proposing is actually half a penny less than than last year, last year's rate. State appropriations: um, we had an increase in, in appropriations of eight hundred seventy-nine thousand due to continued growth in contact hour production. Now, if you go to the next slide. Uh, of course, in order to meet increased departmental expenditure requests and balance the budget, revenues were adjusted as shown. State revenue appropriations increased by 879,000. Maintenance and operation revenue projections increased by 2.167 million, all while maintaining the same tax, same M and O tax rate, and reducing the overall um, tax rate. Going on to the next slide, this is a tax rate history. This slide gives a historical presentation of property tax rate charged to residents over the last five years and the annual homeowner tax bill using an average home, home valuation of 832,000. If you look at the dark blue portion of the graph, graph this represents the debt service rate on outstanding bond obligations. As indicated during years 2018 through 2021, the debt service rate increased from 0.053469 to 0.083304. This represents a time when the college completed issuance of all voter approved bond beginning in 2022. This amount will begin to decline in and to continue to decline, assuming the college issues no new debt. The town portion of the graph shows the maintenance and operation tax. As you can see, this tax remained at the same level over the last two fiscal years and will remain at its lowest level in five years. Once again, in 2022, the college reduced its overall rate by half a penny and reduced the tax burden to the average homeowner by ten dollars and that's my presentation if you have any questions i'll be glad to answer them mr johnson just for clarification because there was a little bit of a static you said that the overall certified property tax value increased by 3.27 percent was that correct yes thank you other questions thank you mr johnson you're welcome Okay, so moving right along to the next slide, estimated debt service tax rate forecast. Uh, the forecast by definition is just an estimate that is subject to changes in our operating environment. This could include changes uh, to Del Mar strategic priorities, the economic landscape, state regulations, fiscal and monetary policy, or natural disasters or health and safety issues. The college's forward motion is deleveraging attributed to three bond maturities, resulting in a downward spiral in debt by $61.3 million, or 22%, by fiscal year 2026. The college will also continue to monitor credit market conditions for bond refunding action items that could result in cost savings that, are, that resemble this past May's bond refunding. This latest bond refunding uh, yielded the college a cost savings of approximately half a million dollars. That's the main takeaway of this slide. If there are any questions, I will be happy to answer. Okay, moving right along. All right. So as requested, uh, this next section, the tax rate com uh, comparison section, includes a comparison of the MNO uh, tax rate by peer group with a backdrop of the various funding strategies used by community colleges throughout our state. We begin with a brief history on the evolution of the three major funding options into various funding strategies currently used today by community colleges uh, throughout the state. The three major funding uh, options that are available include state appropriations, property taxes, and tuition and fees. 
A comprehensive study is needed to determine why there are so many different funding strategies. Based on our assessment of Blinn and Del Mar College, it appears that the value proposition to the student and to the community, uh, and to the community coupled with the unique characteristics uh, of the uh, strategic goals and the operating environment is causing the different funding strategies. We will shortly take a deeper dive into this topic. Uh, Dr. West will now use, uh, guide us into the discussion on the history of the funding. Thank you, Raul. Yeah. Before we get into the detail on the property tax rates, we wanted to provide you with an overview of the major categories of revenue sources for community colleges. And this chart, I think, is, is a really good chart to explain where we're at today with our level of property tax rates and tuition for our students. As you can see, starting in 1986, the state appropriations made up 66% of the funding for community colleges. And that left us with subsidizing the remainder of our operating expenses with tuition and fees and property taxes but look at the percent of those 20 percent and 14 percent and then as you see as as the decline goes down the property the community colleges were forced to increase tuition and fees and property taxes to make up for this difference the resulting level of property taxes and tuition and fees varies between the colleges across the state. And there are many different factors that lead to these variances. Number one, the size of the service ter territory compared to the taxing district. Now there are a few of the colleges that their taxing district is equal to the service territory, Dallas, Tarrant County are an example. But most, the majority of the colleges in the state serve a greater service territory than their taxing district, and Del Mar falls into that category. Another factor is the demographics of the student population. For example, are the students primarily full time students? Are they part time students? What is their ability to pay tuition. Also, what type of degree or certification are they seeking? Are they completing their first two years of college? Or are they older students that are coming back to improve their job skills? Another factor is the strength of the economy in and the type of inter industries in the college's district. And how is the district meeting the workforce development needs of the local industry to support that local industry. Also, the focus of the community college's strategic plan and mission uh, is an important factor into deciding you know, these levels of, of uh, revenues. And an example there is open access, affordability, workforce development, and increased enrollment and retention. And then lastly, the amount and growth of the taxable value in the area is, is a big factor. Okay, so then I'm going to go into this, this chart. And this chart shows the different funding structures that have resulted across the state in the community colleges as they adjusted to the decline in state appropriation funding. So starting to the left, I'll just start to the left, is where the funding structure is primarily comprised of tuition funding. And as you can see, there's just a few of the, the colleges that have that. Um, the next category is local property taxes and tuition. As you can see, most of the colleges fall into this category, and that's where local property taxes and 
tuition and fees are the primary revenue sources. And as you can see, Del Mar falls into that category. And then you have uh, the middle part of the chart um, is where each component is balanced equally. And there are a few of the colleges in the state that do have that funding structure. Then moving to the right of the chart is where the state, the colleges are more dependent on the state and uh, tuition, and then all the way to the right is where they are solely dependent on the state. So therefore, it is important to take into consideration the various types of funding structures that exist across the state when comparing levels of tuition and property taxes between the colleges. And so now I'll turn it over to Ro. Are there any questions on this slide? I, I actually have a question on the last slide. <clears throat> Can we go to the previous slide? Side, sir? Yes, oh, oh. Um, that, that one. That's for the 50 community colleges, correct? Right, that's yes, the sir. average. It, it would be nice to see us projected on that because it looks like we're quite a bit over 50% on the property taxes and the property taxes here appear to be about 40%. Right. So I'd like to see how Delmar compares with the 50. Uh, right, and then note that that ends in 2018, so we could go ahead, we should go ahead and extend the chart out to current year. That, that would be nice as well. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we left off on, on this slide, so I'm just gonna blow it up now, <laughs> and this is how it looks, wow. Right. So here are the different uh, 50 institutions, Mr. Bennett, with the different uh, funding strategies. Uh, and, and, and I do, I, I greatly appreciate your graphs. Yeah. Is that one that you downloaded, by the way? Uh, this information was uh, provided by uh, Ms. Chair Scott. The Texas Association of Community Colleges Steering Committee on the Community College Finance Commission, Dr. Joe May, Chancellor of Dallas Community Colleges, presented this information to that group about, gosh, two or three weeks ago, right as we were having that conversation. So as soon as we finished that, that conversation at our, our July meeting, I sent this to Raul and to the executive committee members and said, this might be very helpful. He gathered the information from CARAT, which is the Coordinating Board Reporting System. Yes. yes. Yep. So, do, do they happen to have one for the total tax rate? I'm sure they do. I, I think that would be helpful as well. And, and yeah, I'm sure they do. So, 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 so let me add to that, that the, the data is very detailed. So it all depends on how you want to manipulate or not manipulate, but uh, pivot or do your graphs or what is the source that you're looking for. So raw data, thousand lines, just a matter of you pivoting to get the information that you wish. But we can definitely do this for you, not a problem. And yeah. I, I like the summary information. Yeah. This one's wonderful. And, and if we had the full tax rate, that, that would be perfect for yeah. me. Yeah. Let me tell you that it was a big challenge is not, not only to figure out where to get the information, but also to recreate the information and then trying to take a deep dive and trying mm -hmm. to understand in preparation for this meeting. So please bear with us and we'll definitely uh, take your uh, recommendation and improve on it, this. So and the other thing I would add, Regent yeah. Bennett, is that uh, the Texas the M and O rates are very comparable, very close uh, to the alignment of the overall rates. Uh, that being said, we, we heard your, your, your request and, and, and concurrence from the nods from the board to, to bring forth that more clarified yes. information. We still remain at, uh, as, as indicated here, about about number six out of the 50. Um, that's been a number that we've held for, for some time. I, again, we're speaking to m and rates here, um, and I just happen to know that, that, that the overall rates are very similar. Um, and so um, I think we're going to, let me see, I don't want to steal any thunder. Okay, we're coming to the end. I'll, I'll just let you proceed, Mr. Garcia. I know we're running short on time. Yes, thank you. I'll Trying to get through this as quickly as possible. Thank you. Uh, so, so the the first observation is that the uh, assessed uh, M and O rate varies, right? Uh, the rate ranges from you know Frank Phillips two cents, and then South Plains thirty nine cents. And as uh, Mark pointed out, we're in the sixth or seventh place. Uh, we we place sixth or seventh on on this chart. Um, and so it, 
I'm going to reiterate, a, a more comprehensive study is needed to understand why the funding strategies vary, right? We can't say, hey, just because he's doing 50 cents, we need to do 50 cents. Hey, it's not that easy. It's a little bit more complex, right? And so based on our simple assessment, it appears that it all has to do with the college's value proposition, strateg strategic goals, and the unique characteristics, I emphasize unique characteristics of the operating environment of the college, right? So uh, what I have then is for you is, is a, I have an example where we're comparing ourselves with Blend College, uh, who is in, within our peer group, right? And they have a tax rate of five cents. It is polar opposite to Del Mar College at 21 cents, right? Again, operating environment uh, is probably an indicator for that. So let's talk about it. So Blend Con College, their funding strategy this is what they say, is highly dependent, and this is what they do, is highly dependent on tuition and fees, which represents 69% of the three major stools. 69% of the three major stools. We'll touch on what that means, right? Uh, and then Del Mar is 27%, okay? And there's a reason for that. The stark difference in funding strategies appears to be driven, again, I'm going to continue to reiterate, value proposition, strategic goals, and unique characteristics of the operating environment, right? So uh, one of Blinn's value proposition, what they say is to deliver top rank academic programs with an enrollment pathway directly to A&M College Station. Oh man, isn't that great? <laughs> College Station, whoa. So this pathway to Texas A&M at College Station allows them, allows them to charge a premium on the tuition and fee, right? This is 13% above Del Mar's tuition and fee rate. 13% above Del Mar's tuition and fee rate, right? Sort of ask yourself, hey, we want to be at that five cents, okay. Possibly 13% increase in tuition and fee rate? Big question mark. I don't know, but food for thought. It's not just that. It's that they are recruiting students from around the state. So they are actually charging out-of-district tuition, and that's where they make most of their revenue, and their local taxpayers do not subsidize that. that so most of, their, most of their student body comes from out-of-district. Yes. Again, operating environment strategic objectives and goals are different, slightly different, right? On the other hand, let's talk about Del Mar's value proposition. It is definitely more broader in scope than Blinn College. Based on our mission statement, our value proposition includes student affordability. Okay, 30%? Mm, no, it contradicts our strategic, our strategic plan, our mission, and our vision, right? That's off the, off the books. We also deliver a wide range of academic uh, delivery platforms and a wide range of academic programs. Uh, Ms. Keyes earlier talked about next year's strategic vision, right? To uh, expand our service areas. This includes our Southside campus and... Aranzas County. Aranzas County, thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, and then, so uh, here's the other thing. What is that? What does our value proposition mean to us? Okay. Our value proposition has also yielded great financial results for us. Del Mar College has the highest 22 23 biennium state funding increase within our peer group, valued at $1.8 million or 5.34%. Now, some of our peer groups did not have the same uh, experience. Um, there was one institution that experienced a decrease of $3.7 million, or 11.32%. Now, are they talking about salary increases for their worthy employees today? I don't know. Big question mark, right? And they're probably thinking about how am I going to sustain uh, in, in, in the long-term perspective of the organization. Big question mark, just food for thought. Polar difference, right? 
Our increase in funding is attributed to an increase in contact hour uh, production and student success performance. So whatever we're doing, to, well, whatever we planned out back in 2019, we've acted today and it's yielding results. $1.8 million. We're at the top of our peer group in terms of increase in state funding. So, uh, and then the next value uh, proposition data point will resonate very well with today's high unemployment reson resonance in our region. As reported in our 2020, in the 2020 Texas Public uh, Higher Education Al Almanac, 67% of our students enrolled in our, our te technical programs are employed after graduation. That's a pretty big number. We rank third highest in this category within our peer group third highest within our peer group. The college is well positioned to deliver today's wide range of technical programs, which is part, part of our value proposition. Uh, this includes our allied health, dental and imaging, nursing, public safety, business administration, computer science, technology, industry, and transportation programs, all well aligned with our local uh, economic growth and economic recovery that's currently happen, happening today, okay? So again, there's so many variables, very complex, that defines the value propositions, which in, 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 in essence translates into the different funding strategies. Are there any questions on this slide? Okay, here we go. All right, bear with me, we're almost done. Last slide, we now have the uh, combined tax rate for our peer group. The combined tax rate ranges from Blends 5 cents to South Plains 39 cents. As previously discussed, Blends value propositions allows them to change a premium tuition rate and a reduced tax rate. Uh, Del Mar's combined tax rate is 28 cents, which is attributed in part to our value proposition that includes student affordability, right? Not Blend, I don't know, 13% above ours, you know. Uh, a wide range of academic programs and a wide uh, range of academic delivery <coughs> platforms. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, if there are no questions, this concludes uh, our presentation. Questions, comments? Yes, Mr. Garza. Uh, going back to the slide that had the different funding uh, oh, strategies, yes. one with the graph, I think it's a little, a little further back, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. that, that one right there. Um, can you explain the dollars that we get on some of the initiatives that we uh, we're working on related to uh, I'm going to say workforce training uh, dollars we get from some of the partnerships that we have with our type A industrial folks type A is a type good A example. Type. Uh, where do these say contributions to our revenue so so, so in this you 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 caught me on my on my nomenclature about the you know, when you talk about the three primary legs of the stool, what we realize, what we always know is that there's actually smaller, uh, lesser legs on the stool. So there's actually four, five, six, depending okay. on how you want to slice it under grants and that sort of thing. So there's a whole other separate category from, from these three, the three primaries that we uh, are discussing here. So it is a, it, that, that is a, a, a different slide with a, um, with a whole different story that complements the budget that, that, that helps us achieve our, our overall goals that way. My only curiosity is that I'd like to know what that percentage is, even if it's 2% or 3%. If it's a small percentage, I'd still oh. like to know so that if some of that, some of those opportunities or some of the support dry it so, up, what so, would be the impact so, so on when our we, ability to do? When we move into the, to the, to the, uh, the next budget meetings, we're going to have the full snapshot, and we'll usually have pie charts um, with those data in there that show the grants and show that how the total budget um, breaks down. I don't know if the if the cross tabs present that um, in the total budget allocations to the hundred show the hundred and ten. Um, it's not in here. There, it, those dollars are not usually added into the MNO budget, but to give an example, um, just what you're talking about, Regent Garza is the Type A board or city. Yeah, they're not in Corpus Christi yeah. in 2017 awarded $2.39 million, and that was equipment to build on West Campus. Our, and those dollars, it's taken three years for us to expend them, mm -hmm. and we're finalizing that. 
Uh, Gulf Coast Growth Ventures donated $1.5 million for equipment. Uh, Chenier Energies donated approximately $1 million over the last five years for equipment. And so that is an ongoing, uh, a lot of that equipment though has a life of 10 years or more. And so when we look at those ancillary dollars, we don't normally, we don't keep them into the m and budget because it, those are project based, I guess I would call it. However, on grants, we do receive Texas Workforce Commission grants, JET grants, other grants that supplement equipment regularly. Would it be prudent though to take some of those equipment investments or contributions that we get and depreciate them in a way that would say we need to put a depreciation, depreciation expense so that the college could afford then to replace some of that equipment 10 years from now? Or would that be something that might be considered? I mean, it's, it's food for thought. Uh, you know, when we talk about federal and state funding, workforce being a state funding uh, uh, program, we really need to be careful between uh, distinct, distinct, distinguishing the two between supplant versus uh, support, right? And so when you start tapping into those grant numbers and saying, oh, we're going to subsidize our operations with grant, that just leads into a whole ball of problems for the institutions. But I do have more information, Mr. Garza, on your, on your question in terms of dollars. In addition to this $110 million that you see here, we get about $19.6 million in student financial aid. That money doesn't stay with us. You know, it goes to the student to help pay for the, for the tuition and fees. And anything money that's left over Del Mar is required to give that money, those excess dollars, over and above the tuition and fees, back to the student so that they can uh, use it for their, uh, for their needs, right? On top of that, we receive approximately about another $5.2 million in federal state funding. That's to send a grant that uh, Lenora talked about a little bit more. Title five. Where it's mm -hmm. going to help fund our uh, QEP initiatives, right? There's some of that. And then you also have the state funding, which is about another $2.1 million that includes those workforce initiatives. So Mr. Garza, in terms of how we manage our finances, this is just one component. We always look for that grant funding opportunity that's gonna help us enhance, and I emphasize enhance, our current uh, uh, operations. Senate grant is a perfect example it's going to improve our QEP advising services. Now that is a grant uh, valued, I think it's about 2.1 million over the next five years. And I'm, I'm still not happy. I'm already looking for the next grant that's available out there to see how that can support our strategic uh, goals. And so it's an ongoing process. So I hope that helps. Yeah, let me, and so to answer your question specifically, it is built into the strategic plan. Um, in terms of, of, of rolling off um, uh, equipment and schedules and, and, and that sort of thing. And that's why we're constantly planning and looking at uh, projecting life, life cycles and, and building in unexpected uh, kinds of things for, for, for certain equipment. Now, that being said, lots of, these, of, lots of this equipment that was donated was donated after the fact, after the plan. Um, they saw that uh, we're, we were building a new building on West Campus and I always tell the story that it's like building uh, building a brand new house, and after you build a new house, you win the lottery and you get a brand new pool. Oh well, gosh, now you got to put it in. Nothing's free, right? So we're dealing with a lot of that too, and so there's a lot of recoil um, to that. And and as Mr. Garcia says, he's never happy about the dollars, and so that's kind of a good thing that we that we recognize with him um, because he's constantly watching this. We still have opportunities. Um, and, 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 and areas of, of improvement to, to, to pull out to, to build out um, lifespans and life cycles of, of, of equipment. Um, there's still opportunities to improve there. Yeah. 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 And, and then any, any program opportunity, we always talk about, okay, what are the equipment needs? You know, and how can we, how can we use those dollars to leverage uh, some, some equipment items for the institution? So that's part of the, the thought process. Uh, each time we go out for a proposal. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Yeah. So I understand the revenue is accounted for over several years and specific grant allocations and it, 
I don't I don't understand it, but I, I hear you saying that. Are the employees though and the expenses for those programs a part of this M and O budget or are those accounted for separately as well? Yes. Yeah, so there are grants that fund uh, uh, employees, yes. And so uh, those costs are not reflected in here. If it is funded by the grant, it's taken out of the equation right here. None of the grant funded employee salaries or benefits are included in this $110 million. Why? Because it's already being funded by the grant. That's taken out of the equation. So our projects send uh, employees, for example, those wouldn't show up on our m and Unless they're institutionalized. Right. Okay. So there are there are within the grants there are institutionalized employees that are put in brought into the the, the overall operating budget yeah. the regular budget if you will, yeah. and then some that remain um, as grant employees. Yeah. Now there may be some employees that uh, the grant may allow us to charge their salary, and so say Raul Garcia, you know, is part of the Senda grant. Fifty percent of my time is dedicated to that. So then. My 50% in that scenario, part of it would be included in here, the one 50%. The other 50% would be taken out and charged to the grant. Okay. Mr. Bennett? Uh, I do have a question on the tuitions and fees. We're, we're budgeting about $26 million. And did you just say that $19 million is covered by grants? No. No, 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 no. Uh, tuition and fees? No, no. We're, I think we're talking about two different things, right? And, and maybe I, I misspoke. So maybe I misunderstood. Okay. So what, what's the nineteen million? Financial aid. So yeah, thank you. The financial aid. Ah, okay. The I students. see. I see there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, nineteen million. Let's just let's just say uh, ten dollars is the revenue component. <laughs> My tuition of ten dollars is in the revenue component uh, of this budget, right? I get a Pell and I get it for $12. Well, I'm not collecting the $10. You're not collecting the $10 from Raul Garcia. You're not going to collect it from Uncle Sam, right? Under the Pell grant, right? I still have my $10 revenue, woo, right? But now <laughs> I'm collecting it from someone else, right? Someone else is paying for that tax. So that $19 million represent a payment of someone else's receivable. Someone else's receivable. $19 million is gonna to go towards partially to pay the student's tuition, and the other piece, that they're gonna pocket it, go home, go buy books, go buy a computer, what have you. So, so a majority of that tuition revenue is gonna be funded by grants to the so, students. So I believe that these uh, our tuition revenue is in net of, net of uh, mm -hmm. Is it net tuition or is that gross? It's gross. It's gross. Okay. It's gross. So yes. So our gross re revenue, let's just say it's fifty million dollars, and let's just say the full nineteen million. What that is called is tuition discounting. And so you're right. When you look at uh, when we talk about student affordability, and I think we touched on that back in December, we talked about tuition discounting, and so that plays a big difference as to who's paying for it, right? But our tuition re revenue is gross, and it gets discounted as the Pell comes in under the accounting framework. Does that help? Well, I, I, I might be a bit confused. confused. Um, yeah. So just basically, the, the students get a bill for $26 million. How much of that's going to be paid for out of their pocket, and how much out of financial aid? Just roughly. Seven million. So the majority of it's paid out, out of financial aid. Ms. Keys, can you respond into your yeah. microphone? Sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry, yes. Uh, for tuition and fees, we report that at a gross amount as far as revenue. So financial aid is approved by the students based on their ability to pay or their financial need, and those dollars then pay the tuition and fees on behalf of that student. So the, the difference when you increase in tuition and fees is felt by all. However, the federal government through financial aid or Pell Grants or scholarships is really 
paying for a lot of that. Yeah, we, yeah. we understand that. What of the yeah. twenty-six million? I think he's asking how much is paid, either percentage or dollar amount, approximately by grants. Well, if by to well. So, so let me pull up the audited financial statements because I don't have that percentage with me in my mind. Bear with me a few minutes. Because in our audit financial statements, and you can fact check this, uh, and you know I love to talk accounting. <laughs> Everyone does. <laughs> Bear with me. So in our audit financial statements, what you will see is reported is the net revenue, and on the side there's a little note that says tuition discount, right? And it's all about data-driven decisions, right? So here we go. <laughs> And I'm sorry for digressing here, but it's a very good question that I think merits uh, an adequate response. Uh, and I'll do my best. Okay, so fiscal year 2020, 12.5 million is my net revenue. Okay. My discount is $17.7 million. Total revenue is about $30 million. So you want to say mm -hmm. the discount that we deliver to our students is somewhere on the ballpark of about 50%. That is driven by our strategic plan. Not only that, but also the state federal government allows it. They'll go in, they'll do their assessment, student applies, federal government will say, based on these different financial indicators, personal financial indicators, you qualify for this. What does that tell you? In terms of, remember I said, value proposition and how there's different uh, indicators that influence our environment, operating, operating environments, our students, are very needy. I still think we're, we're trying to answer a question, yeah. not the philosophy. Right. <laughs> Can you ask your question again, Mr. Bennett? Well, I think, well, I, I, I think we've about covered it. What, what I'm thinking is this means that not only is it a bargain, it is an extreme bargain. Mm -hmm. And my question then is, do the potential students understand that? Because it's not free, but it's almost free. And I wanted to add, I think when, he, when uh, Mr. Garcia is using the term discount, it's not that we've reduced, what you and I normally think of as a discount, it's not that we've reduced tuition and fees that much, it's that they've been paid by a third party. That is correct. Yes, sure. It's been discounted yes, for. Like, not, not like the discount financial that we're giving. But still to I'm your sorry. Point. Or but, yeah. federal but, government. Or but that still yeah. makes it an extreme bargain. And, and my question remains, do the potential students understand how cheap it is? And I guess that's a rhetorical question. It's one, it's one of our favorite questions. Affordability is one of our ongoing questions, and I, I, I look forward to many, many more conversations here in the near future about that affordability factor. We continue to push it out, and, and um, um, I, would, it's, I think my simple answer for that question for today is some do and some don't, <laughs> unfortunately. Any other questions related to these uh, tax rate comparisons? Any other questions related to the budget presentation today? All right. Uh, you'll, any other, anything else to wrap up? No, thank you, thank you, Mr. Garcia. <laughs> yes. You, you, read the, you read the body language. We are going to uh, t recess, and we're actually going to do our closed session uh, over what's left of our lunch hour. Uh, so we are going to go into closed session under Texas Government Code 551.071 uh, regarding pending or contemplated litigation or settlement offer with possible discussion and action open session and the seeking of legal advice from counsel on pending legal or contemplated matters or claims with possible discussion and action in open session. And under Texas Government Code 551.074A1, regarding the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer employee, including the possible discussion and action in open session. The time is 12.52 p.m. We are, we are um, 
going into closed session. Thank you. All right, Regents, we have come back from closed session at 2.11 p.m. with no action out of closed session. Uh, we are going to postpone our recognitions. Um, Stinson could not be with us today. And we are going to move into our student success report. Is Dr. Halcom joining us in person? Patricia? Yes. Oh. Are you going to join us? Yes. Okay. Oh, if we're going to get Patricia instead. Yes. Dr. Halcom was going to join us. He was supposed to join us. You want to go ahead? Yep. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Board of Regents, Dr. Escamilla. Come on, Dr. Jonda. You're welcome. Okay, <laughs> just distant, keep your distance. You know, yeah, there you go. Oh. However, y'all want to do that. Oh, okay. Um, Madam Chair, thank you so much for letting us always present a student success report. I think the data is very important, showing the quality of the education of Del Mar College, the quality of our faculty, staff, and especially our stellar students. Today, um, Ms. Patricia Benavides Dominguez is going to highlight the OSHA 30-hour safety training course. Thank you. Thank you, Jonda. Um, the student success point that I'm going to discuss today is to highlight the OSHA 30 hour safety training course. Yeah. Um, although uh, OSHA training has been around for, for quite some time, uh, during the 2018-2019 CE developed a uh, 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 this course to develop, uh, you know, the needs, develop this course for industry needs. As you can see by the slide, since 2018, 2019, this course has had a uh, high enrollment interest and students exiting this course have excelled with a 90% pass rate or better. During 2018, 2019, you can see that there were 96 students that enrolled in the course and had a 100% pass rate. In the 19, uh, 19 to 2020, there was 393 students, 355 passing with a 90% rate. And for 2020, 2021, there was 163 enrollments, 151 students passed with a 93% pass rate. We anticipate this course will uh, continue to be in high demand Dr. Leonard Rivetta and uh, Davis Merrill, our Dean of Industry and Public Service, work together in promoting this course. Uh, a little bit more background about this course. Uh, the OSHA training program provides training and recognizing uh, uh, and avoiding abatement and preventing workplace uh, hazards. The classes also overview information regarding OSHA and uh, uh, individual worker rights, employee responsibilities, and how to file a complaint. Included in the training, promoting uh, a safety culture through peer training, training uh, throughout uh, part through par participatory hands-on activities. And it emphasizes the value of safety, health to workers, uh, and including our young employ uh, employers, workers. Do you have any questions? Saying none. Thank you so much, Patricia. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. We'll move on to our college president's report, Dr. Escamilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Regents, I'll be somewhat brief because uh, the topic that I'm going to be presenting on it has to do with return to campus and things are evolving quickly. And uh, there will be subsequent uh, communications and reports that uh, will be uh, more detailed. That suffice it to f say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, things are changing in our community as it relates to uh, the, the pandemic and, and uh, there's some localized um, dynamics going on uh, with infection rates and we're watching them very closely. The executive team, the return to campus committee and I continue to monitor the COVID-19 situation and adjust our, our protocols accordingly. <clears throat> 
locally hospitalization we realize that local uh, hospitals hospitalization rates due to COVID-19 is rising daily and hospitals are being stressed um, due to lack of uh, personnel and, and various other resources. Due to the spike in positive cases, the college uh, continues to maintain uh, social distancing guidelines uh, through the fall semester along with other protocols such as hand cleansing um, and other safety uh, types of measures, uh, which also includes all the logistics that, are, as it, uh, that relate to that um, with, you know, with supplies and so forth uh, to make sure that those things happen. We are encouraging uh, and emphasizing uh, distancing um, as we have for, for, for a long time now. But uh, again, as things are changing, we are really uh, uh, adjusting our messaging and, and trying to be as clear as we can to encourage um, and, and, um, and emphasize uh, the necessity and the usefulness of these protocols that have been around for over 18 months now. Fall classes and specifically um, their delivery methods um, are being adjusted to accommodate um, distancing and other um, other measures um, um, in the classrooms, especially those that are largely concentrated with uh, uh, students and require um, a more closely held um, types of instruction. The result is where last year we were at this time we were probably at approximately 60% online or maybe even a little bit more than that um, at this time um, where that flipped to where uh, last latter part of spring where we were closer to 40% especially going into summer um, um, that we're online it's it's more of about a 50 50 uh, at this point again we have um, a few days left a few precious short uh, amount small amount of days before we we kick off the fall semester um, and we will pivot as necessary um, the college will uh, likely remain um, in a phase three environment uh, through the fall at least uh, again um, but we will come back to you as we uh, adjust protocols as necessary uh, we will remain open to students and employees facial coverings will strongly be recommended. We will strongly recommend um, those uh, facial coverings. We will provide uh, for those who may not have them, who may have gotten a little lax, a little too comfortable and the like, and or forgotten them. We will work uh, to make sure that, that, uh, that those who want them will have them and really uh, do our part to recommend um, that they use them. Again, and also events um, will be on a case-by-case basis for evaluation as to whether we should even hold them or not and so we're, we're, we're being very cautious there um, graduation uh, is is that is the biggest one at this point and I, I think we've already made that adjustment we have to we have to make adjustments based on what we know today and I, it's, it's very unlikely that we will ask p- uh, families and people to congregate um, in in the American Bank Center um, later this fall stay tuned I'll come back to you on that confirmation but ladies and gentlemen I, I would like to say that I'd like to add that um, the silver lining in, in this, I have to find the silver lining so that I can, um, that's what I have to do. I have to find the positive in this. And the best news out of all of this is that we've never been better prepared as a college for a situation like this. Last year, this time we were going through, we didn't have half the pre- preparedness, half the training, um, half the, 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 the resources, the knowledge and so forth that we have today. Um, we do realize that, that, that the numbers out there in our local community um, aren't where they need to be, we believe, with regard to uh, vaccinations and those sorts of things. Um, and we will ask um, our uh, community um, to, to give it the strongest consideration before they come on campus and before they become part of, of, of this campus. Um, stay tuned with that. Um, but for right now, um, again, we are, uh, we are positioned uh, extremely well, and we are, um, we are ready to take on the semester. Uh, but I, we, we ask uh, for everybody's uh, flexibility out there and those who are listening um, to, this, uh, to these remarks and, uh, and my, my, uh, from our position here, that they cooperate with us and help us, help us get through so that they can achieve their education 
and because we know their lives depend on this education as well. So we'll uh, stay tuned for more messaging. And um, this concludes my report. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding what I've um, reported today. Are there any questions for Dr. Escamilla? I would like to add on behalf of the board uh, our encouragement uh, for vaccinations and for folks wearing masks uh, and social distancing within the classroom. We know that with this Delta variant, the best deterrent is a vaccination. Uh, and so uh, as, as community leaders, uh, we want to encourage our students uh, and all of our faculty and staff and their families to please get vaccinated. Uh, this, we all want things to go back to normal, but wishful thinking isn't gonna make it happen. It only happens when you take proactive measures including vaccinations and facial coverings to make that happen for you and your family. So we uh, look forward to seeing folks back on campus, but we cannot emphasize enough and, and encourage you enough to uh, become vaccinated and to wear your facial coverings uh, throughout this, these next few weeks as we deal with this variant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Escamilla. Regents, we have uh, several items on our pin, excuse me, we're gonna go to pending item uh, list which is next on our agenda. We've got several items uh, in September, including a key performance indicators discussion uh, workshop of our strategic plan. Uh, you'll see that we have added in those workshop sessions uh, for September, December, March, and June of next year with those topics. You'll also note in our pending items list that we are looking at a date for a board retreat in November hoping that we can um, accomplish that. Uh, team building will be fresh off of two conferences, uh, whether those happen virtually or in person for, for attendees. We'll have our state conference in September and our national conference in October. And so we'll have, I think, some plenty of good ideas to spur that discussion for our board retreat in November. You can see the rest of the pending, light, pending items there. And we will move on to our consent agenda items. Um, consent agenda was our items provided to you in advance. Are there any items that need to be pulled for separate discussion or consideration? Seeing none, is there a motion to adopt consent agenda items one, two, and three? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Hutchison. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Moving on to our regular agenda, we will now hear uh, internal, uh, internal audit follow-up reports. Ms. Tammy McDonald. Thank you. In the continuation of our internal audit work, today we will have virtually participating, we will have Dan um, Graves and Brandon Tanos with Weaver, and they will be conducting the report of our follow-up reports, status of some uh, consulting work in our current year's plan, in a risk assessment. So Dan, are you and Brandon connected? Yes, ma'am, we're here. Okay, well, we're I'm here. Gonna, okay, now I'm gonna be Thank the you. driver of the presentation. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand here and do the slides for you. So go ahead and, and get started, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy, and thank you, board, for having us. And, uh, you know, appreciate you. Uh, and concern for us having us present remotely, uh, again, just what you've expressed with uh, the health and safety of everyone on campus. We appreciate that. And so, as Tammy mentioned, Tammy, if you'll go to the next slide, as Tammy mentioned, we're going to bring to you the the status of uh, the internal audit plan for fiscal year 2021 and the, the conclusion of that plan, which includes uh, the follow up reports over student services purchasing, a quick status update on the consulting policy project, and then um, bring to you the 2022. Uh, internal audit plan status and or sorry the 21 recap that and then talk to you about what's coming up for 2022 so I'm going to turn this over to Brandon Brandon led the audits over student services and purchasing and I'm going to let him address those uh, to you thank you Dan good afternoon board uh, as the first uh, follow-up internal audit that we performed was of course for student services uh, that field work was executed during a period of about February 15th through July 29th, related to the findings from the original 2019 internal audit report over student services. Uh, that report was issued uh, to management on July 29th uh, with their management responses. So the scope of, of our audit of those procedures focused really on the remediation efforts taken by management to address the findings included in that 2019 report for student services. 
to validate that the appropriate corrective action was taken. Uh, the report of student service contained six findings originally, uh, and our previous follow-up procedures that we've done in 2019 and 2020 identified four findings that had been remediated prior to the 2021 follow-up procedures that we're reporting on today. Next slide. So we evaluated the corrective action for two of the partially remediated findings. And so, uh, as you can see in the summary of results uh, from our procedures, we've identified that one has been remediated and one has been partially remediated. Um, before we did perform procedures and found updates uh, that uh, uh, processes that were changed and implemented, so those went from partially remediated and we reevaluated those in these procedures. Um, I first wanted to touch on, touch on the remediated uh, finding, uh, which was finding five about the disability accommodation letters. Uh, if you recall, when we originally uh, evaluated uh, that process, uh, the college did kind of paint itself in a corner and require a one-day turnaround uh, for processing those letters and identified with management that that really wasn't feasible with the process that had to perform. Um, and we did identify that policy administrative procedure A7.8 uh, was submitted to administration on February 10th and adopted on June 1st. And that revised policy really removes that requirement for the one working day for faculty review, sign and reject, uh, or reject and return that accommodation letter. And the new policy actually says it must be done in a timely manner. So what we've done is reviewed that policy. And then also we did test the accommodation letters. Uh, there was uh, 75 uh, that were processed within our five, uh, five month scope period. Uh, and we did see that 23 of those were greater than a day. Uh, but we all we believe that all of those were timely. They were done in an average of about eight days. Uh, and any of those over were uh, escalated appropriately until they were returned with the documentation trail. So we consider that finding as being remediated. Um, and our partially remediated uh, goes back to uh, our finding one at that time as a best uh, advising sessions documentation. So we heard earlier about the expansion of the advising and the, and the great benefits that has definitely on the students there at the college. Um, but definitely with that, and we saw in our follow-up procedures in FY20 that there was expansion and uh, of the advisor refresher training and documentation of that, the training on the requirements and what must be logged within colleague and Civitas and analyzed records. Um, we re-performed our comparative analysis really of a listing of students who had an advising hold removed from colleague over five months, uh, along with student outreach records and Civitas. Um, and we identified that there is still about a 42% um, uh, rate of actual documentation within colleague and about 2% logged within Civitas. Now, working with management, we did identify that, you know, when we do have expanded advising, um, you have more than just the embedded call embedded and dedicated advisors. So that is their really full-time job when you have faculty advisors um, that are also doing that advising. There's some additional training uh, and uh, you know, having that refresher training and understanding of what are those requirements. Um, definitely management uh, understands that and, and is looking to continue to improve those processes for tracking and documenting those interactions that be consistent uh, for all student records. Um, and also there's a component of looking at the new ERP system that will be coming into play uh, to show what, how we can make required fields. So when a student is uh, being advised uh, that those notes have to be entered before it can close out of that student record. Um, so with that, on our evaluations, uh, we did identify that college uh, personnel management made efforts to remediate those findings and follow-up procedures for the remaining open findings should be included in FY22 um, after further training has occurred and. Uh, discussion on really kind of how to look at embedded um, versus dedicated uh, advisors. So I'll, I'll add uh, their board that tracking year to year, that the overall, this is a, an internal requirement. There's no external requirements for this standard. It's, it's the college's own requirement about how advisors document the sessions. It's clear that the advising sessions take place. Uh, it's the documentation of those efforts that is is the nature or the, the nexus of this finding. And uh, year to year, it is improving. So there's positive uh, movement forward into meeting the, the standards of the college. And uh, as we heard earlier today, uh, Brandon and I have been you know, here for, for most of the meeting. 
and we heard a lot about the QEP plan, and I know that these are continued focused efforts uh, from the student services and, and advisors through the QEP and those efforts uh, in advising. So, Great points, Dan. So we'll go to the next slide. So then we're going to go now to the purchasing follow-up internal audit. Uh, so we performed, we executed our procedures during March 31st through June 7th related to those findings from the original 2017 internal audit report of our purchasing. And that report was issued in June 7th. Uh, the follow-up procedures focused on the remedia, remediation efforts taken by management to address really the two open findings included in that original report and to validate that that corrective action was taken. In 2017, we had uh, 13 findings, and follow-up procedures identified that 11 of those had been remediated prior to the follow-up procedures we are discussing with you today. Next slide. So we evaluated the corrective action of two internal audit uh, findings identified in that report. You'll see one was remediated and one was considered closed. Um, and I'll first talk about the remediated. So uh, our finding five is a, a lack of formal delegation of authority um, and we uh, definitely discussed with risk management and procurement. Uh, we did identify that professional services and bond contracts are presented to the Board of Regents for review, and those contracts are submitted to the Office of Risk Management, and they are manually tracked by professional services and contracts included in that presentation to you all. We also examined the purchasing single author uh, signature authority delegation and determined that the college has implemented a delegation of authority. That includes purchase approval thresholds, and contract signature authority, which addresses the condition we identified. So we consider that finding remediated. Um, our next one that we consider closed is the contract renewals um, about being those being done timely. So if you recall, um, when we looked at this in FY20, we did um, look at uh, testing of train, uh, purchase orders for contracts over 50,000 um, that were processed in about a, a one year period um, for each purchase, purchase order, we did verify that there was a valid contract at the time of the purchase to, to ensure that there was no purchases being done on an invalid or expired contract. Um, and we had further discussions really about with management on how are we monitoring that systematically so that we're not having to manually track um, when contracts need to be renewed. Um, and definitely that is something that's going to be looked at um, as part of the new ERP system with purchasing and risk management and IT to identify what kind of capabilities will be there uh, to monitor that. Um, therefore, due to the, the low error rate that was identified in the last uh, two years of follow-ups and the future implementation of that system, uh, we consider this finding to be closed. Um, and so based on our evaluation, of course, uh, college personnel did make those efforts to remediate those findings and uh, we do not have on our plan um, for next year that Dan will be talking about follow-up procedures for purchasing. Anything else to add, Dan? No, nothing else. Um, before we move into the next part of our presentation, I'd like to open up to see if uh, anyone on the board has any questions about these two reports. Any questions? Mr. Bennett has a question. Uh, I do. Am I understanding this correctly? It looks like we're, we're not really using our software if only 2% were logged in Civitas and uh, colleague had only 42 percent were logged. Are, are we not using the software? I note that Patricia the, is here. Uh, she was. I here. would say that the software is being used. Uh, the software is definitely used as part of the advising session. Um, the logging of the activities and notes of the advising session are the two items where you, the college does have two places to store those notes and you're correct that is in colleague and, and or civitas and so we have a, a 44 percent rate um, that we were able to identify that those notes have been made so, so the, the software is used the extent of the software uh, could be used more based on what we found through the the testing of the audit is that going to be corrected call? with our new our new computer system I will like because I do I do participate in all the exit meetings and in, in the reports for for the audits and I do know that that is something that we are moving into and exploring that the new ERP will have a one one place that these notes will be uh, documented and tracked instead of either you can use 
Civitas or you can use colleague it'll be in one place so I know that that's part of the plan as they're moving into the student service modules is to have the new ERP act in that capacity um, it doesn't mean that advising isn't happening it means that we have some opportunities to be more efficient and effective and efficient for documenting that into our system it doesn't mean that someone doesn't have written notes for documentation it's just taking that and putting it into Automating it, automating, yes. Yes. automating and those yes. processes, or or what we're the ERP is the is the big is the primary purpose for for converting and moving over. So the whole idea is not only here but in many other areas, as automating as much as we can. Um, that's been the case for the past um, I think almost 14 years now that uh, the current um, ERP was not handling for us and or we weren't using. Um, or didn't get built out appropriately. So, so I guess I'm wondering what the effect of not documenting it is. Is that student going to be subject to a duplicate uh, advising session because it wasn't documented in the system? No. How no. do they get around? No, that? I don't believe so. I, I think the the impact, uh, as I tried to elaborate, is that this is a, a college standard. So this is how. The college is choosing to yes. document uh, the advising sessions and, and what was discussed. So, potentially, if the student got advised by a second advisor, you know, advisor A got them on a path. They they developed a plan, had them registered for courses. Then they go back and advisor A is no longer with the college, or for whatever reason they meet with advisor B. Advisor B doesn't have the notes and and history behind what's happened before and what the current plan was. So that's the potential impact to the student. Um, it is an internal standard and, and we have as part of what we were talking about with the student services group and, and how to help make this more effective is through the new implementation of, a, of the ERP is to look at trying to make this a required field to close out an advising session so that um, we, you don't have the option to complete the advising session without making notes. Uh, and so that, those are some of the things that, that is part of the remediation efforts that is being explored to, to help make sure that we have some continuity through advising sessions, um, no matter who the advisor is, whether it's a, a dedicated advisor or whether it's a faculty uh, advisor. And, and have one place that is our primary designated software, which would, as we move forward, would be the new ERP instead of having an option of two others, because then you have to go look in two different systems right now to find notes. Um, because they're not tied together necessarily so it would be having one place one I guess a one-stop shop to look for advising notes and, and part of the, the the management response for this particular uh, finding was also to look and identify the areas that maybe we are we need we have opportunities to be more efficient in documenting and tracking and to identify those areas and to go out and provide some additional training on where you need to go and document and track so that, that was one of what management has committed to, is to work across the college with all the different um, advisors and, and faculty advisors to help identify which areas um, can improve upon their documentation and tracking. The electronic documentation, like I said, we're not saying they're not documenting it on their own notes, it's just putting it into a system. So if it's not in the system, would we miss advising a, a student? It, if a student hasn't been advised, and we have so few that are in the system, could we accidentally miss advising him? No, um, and that's a, that's a very easy no, because the students have an advising hold placed on their account, and they cannot register for classes unless they see an advisor to release that advising hold. So that's, uh, that's a control within the process that they cannot... Uh, you cannot go unadvised and still okay. register for classes. Very good. Any other questions? You can continue, Dan. Thank you. So, Tim, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, wanted to give you an update on the, the rest of the internal audit plan. And so, with that, we do have our policy project consulting that we've been interacting uh, off and on throughout the year with the board. Uh, we have gone through our next step uh, of Weaver was to work on the organization of the college policies. And so we have uh, 
I've met with Tammy as the owner of the, the policy project and, and the organization of policies and presented a preliminary structure uh, where we proposed some reorganization. Uh, we received some feedback and we are revising our uh, what we have proposed so that there's uh, essentially so that there's less change. What, what we'd come back with um, we wanted to be able to make it closer to what you currently have uh, and I say that in the fact of like a numbering scheme so that we're not completely changing what is currently section one and making it section three. If we can keep the sections and uh, order somewhat the same, we think it would be an easier transition to make for the college. And so we are reworking that and going to represent that. And once that's ready, um, we can bring that back to the board and show uh, what we've worked on with management as far as the organization. Uh, and then also we had grants management and uh, as we presented earlier this year, uh, grants management uh, activities, we did not reschedule any for fiscal 2021. We provided the grants audit and follow up and now we understand with the, the grants department as it was newly structured as a result of some of the audit findings some of the plan training, the new deployment of policies, that um, there was no additional assistance that was requested from us as your auditor to uh, help provide any other assistance or, or help provide any additional consulting to move, move that grants function forward. So we did not have any other uh, additional activities under grants management this year. And Tim, if we go to the next slide, that uh, this presents the, the full uh, picture of the audit plan. Uh, we gave you the status on the policy project and grant administration. Uh, those consultings, again, we didn't do. All the follow-up reports uh, that we could issue this year are complete. We do have admissions and registrar and that uh, follow-up. As we continue to follow up through the year with the admissions and registrar uh, groups that um, that would not be ready for follow-up until after August this year. So we will continue to monitor that and have it on our plan. And then also uh, with I the IT general controls, we had open findings. We know that there was another consulting group brought in to help make some corrections. And when those are ready, we will follow up on those as well. As the final piece of our presentation, uh, Tammy, if you go to the next slide, we have the 2022 internal audit risk assessment. And so the risk assessment that we last performed was in 2016, and we've annually revisit the risk assessment and sit down and, and determine whether or not that the picture that we sort of drew as the risk profile for the college in 2016, excuse me, in 2016, if it was still accurate. We revisited that every year as we continue to look at the plans for, for each year. Um, however, uh, it's it's time for a, a new refresh. There's been a lot of change at the college. There's been new operations, new uh, facilities, uh, obviously with changes in operations over the last year uh, that were out of the college's control. There's just been a lot of change, and it is time to have a, a refresh. And so we are going to revisit uh, all the activities that we have on our plan. We'll revisit the key risk definitions and really what risks are most prevalent and important to the college um, now being five years later, almost six years uh, from the first risk assessment, we'll look at how the manage current or how the college currently manages and responds to those risks. And we are going to perform a new, a fresh look at the risk assessment. Um, and that is planned for later this month or, or in September, we're, we're still working and defining the dates and once we complete that risk assessment process, we'll develop a multi-year internal audit plan and bring that back to uh, management and, and then you, the board, for approval. And we will we'll have a structured and planned approach so that each year's internal audits can layer on the next one and it can be a, a well-thought-out uh, plan and, and laid out in succession so that the college gets the most benefit from the internal audit efforts. And so that will be forthcoming uh, either in the September or October board meeting. And that that will uh, decide the plan for uh, the fiscal year 2022 and then 
tentative plans for fiscal years 23 and 24. Uh, in addition to when we present that, we will also bring the annual internal audit report. Um, that annual audit report is a report that um, is generally required of state institutions by the Texas Internal Audit Act. Uh, the college is not subject to that act, but um, has chosen to uh, voluntarily file that report with the state auditor's office. And so uh, the state auditor's office prescribes the format of that report. That just came out last week. Uh, there is no new guidance uh, compared to the prior year that has a, a drastic change for the college. And so we will also provide that annual report. Uh, part of that annual report includes uh, the plan for fiscal 2022. So we'll bring all that to you, <coughs> excuse me, in tandem. Uh, to be approved before we send that report to the SAO. So with that, I'll open up for any questions on the consulting plan or the, the risk assessment process that's planned for uh, the future. Are there any additional questions for Dan or for Tammy? If not, staff has asked us uh, to take action to accept this internal audit follow-up report and status reports as presented. Is there a motion to that effect? M Mr. Bennett makes a motion. Mr. Garza seconds. Any questions on that motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Dan and Brandon, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. Have Thank a great you. Day. All right, we will move into our uh, discussion and action on the quarterly investment report. Mr. Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, uh, today we have Ms. Linda Patterson from Patterson & Associates, who, in the interest of time, will deliver a brief presentation on our quarterly investments. Linda. Thank you. Can we have the slides? On the first slide, I just, I will make these points very, very quickly, but on the next slide you'll see that the uh, the yield curve, the rates that are available are, have remained almost identical to what they were last quarter. And I think what, what you have to focus on is that even out to the two-year area, the yields that are available in the market generally are um, less than one quarter of 1%. On a good day, they are, they are uh, 0.21. And on the next slide, uh, even though the curve looks like that, um, we have a really solid recovery going. There are all kinds of growth signs everywhere. Employment is good. Workers are scarce, but they're getting jobs if they want them. Uh, consumers are starting to go back to the store and buy things, which of course pushes up inflation, but also shows us that everybody has confidence that that's where we're going. Um, GDP came out at 6.5, a nice strong overall gross domestic product for us. Um, possibly the only thing holding back a little bit is this fear of inflation, uh, which is out there but not as strong as it needs to be right now. On the next slide, uh, because of these conditions, uh, there are three primary risks, and as the Fed keeps their eye on everything that's going on in the economy here in the United States, but also globally, um, we have the, the Delta variant, of course, which everyone is very familiar with, and now um, the Lambda variant, which is coming on its heels. So that's a big risk to the economy and to what the Fed wants to do. Um, the second big risk is the flooding of the economy with all of the money, the stimulus money coming out, the infrastructure package, which has passed, and now the new additional $3 trillion coming out that is going to the Senate um, this week, I believe. And then the final third primary risk that we're watching is, and that the Fed is definitely watching, is the debt ceiling. Because of all of this, the Fed will um, decide whether in the fall at, that they start to taper. And that means that as soon as they say that and actually start the action, then the market's going to anticipate that eventually, maybe 2022, that the rates are going to start to go up. But there's so many risks out there right now that we have to be cautious about what we anticipate. 
On the next slide, you can see the makeup of the entire Del Mar portfolio. And this would look very similar percentage wise to what we saw last quarter. What you will see in a few minutes is that the 2020 series bonds and the 2018 series bonds are being spent down um, quite a bit. Um, and so those portions of the pie are getting a little bit smaller. But on the next slide, um, even though if you take the 2018 and the 2020 bond funds out of the equation and you look at all of the rest of the pooled funds for the college, um, you can see that the book value of the portfolio has gone up with revenues um, from 122 to 125 million. Still a good uh, market value there, so you're in unrealized gains. Uh, a lot of that money as it is spent out, of course, um, gets reinvested, the new money gets reinvested, but as, as the money drains out at the same time, that's why you see that wham moving from a longer 190 days down to 143. But if you remember that uh, on the graph, we looked at the two years at a 0.2, or actually at about a 0.17 right now, um, and the yield is a, a 0.30. So it's a nice almost double pickup. And that compares to your benchmark of a 0.04. The earnings were up a little bit. Um, as the rates move around, uh, we're going to see that jumping back and forth every quarter for uh, probably another year. On the next slide, I took the the same pooled funds and looked at them. And as I say, these percentage-wise look very similar. Excuse me, very similar. Um, although the the use of municipal bonds has gone up, has gone down a little bit and commercial paper has gone up because commercial paper is the only thing really with any value out there out to the one year area. And you can see on the bottom why the choices are made the way they are, um, even though all of the rates are slowing down, um, still the better rates are in the municipal debt and in the federal agencies and the, pool and the commercial paper. The next slide looks at the 2018 tax bonds. And this is why I was saying that these are being spent out uh, quite quickly. Last quarter was 54 million in the 18 bonds and it's down to 40 million now. Um, as that liquid money was pulled out, there's just a natural jump out with the WAM jumping from, or the weighted average maturity, jumping from close to 300 days out to over 400. Um, and a lot of the agencies on here are getting called anyway. So that's, that's kind of a natural flow. But those were invested um, bef before a lot of the yields went down. And so you have great, great yields sitting on this portfolio portion of the portfolio at a 0.58 compared to your benchmark of a 0.4. On the next slide, the same look, but on the 2020 bonds, and here again, big um, use of funds um, going out of the portfolio from 83 million down to 66 million, and um, the way I'm also moving down, but holding pretty steady on the yield there at about what would be equated to a two year um, at a 0.255 versus your benchmark. Um, here you can see even with, with that drop in the amount of the funds, um, the earnings for the quarter uh, also dropped from 81,000 down to 61,000. And if we look at the pie graph on the next, uh, on the next slide, you, look, you can see um, exactly what's happening here because there's such a uh, a lot of expenses to the two to the 2018 and the 2020. A lot of the money is being held very very liquid in the pool. Unfortunately, that's a very low rate. But um, as these expenses build up and as money flows out, you have to have that liquidity in there. So we use the pools and the commercial paper, especially for the very short portion. So fit over 50% of the, of the funds are sitting very, very liquid, ready to be paid for anything they're needed for. And um, that concludes my comments.
about as fast as I can talk, uh, but I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Linda. Are there any questions for Ms. Patterson? If not, is there a motion to accept or approve the uh, college's quarterly investment report? Mr. Garza makes the motion. Second. Ms. Hutchison seconds that. Any questions on the motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Uh, we'll now move on to the um, adoption of our annual investment policy. Mr. Garcia? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with board policy, there's an annual review of the investment policy and strategies followed by uh, a recommendation by Ms. Linda Patterson. Linda, if you please. Uh, there were no changes in legislation this year on the Public Funds Investment Act, and um, the college has been staying up with everything needed in the for the portfolio management, so we're not suggesting any changes to the investment policy this year. So there is, thank you very much, Ms. Patterson. There is a resolution adopting our, um, our uh, policy as it stands with no changes being made. Is there a motion to that effect? Second. Ms. Mr. Kelly makes the motion. Ms. Avert seconds. Are there any questions on that motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. And finally, the uh, authorization for our broker dealer list. Thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with Public Investment Act, Delmar College is required to review, uh, revise, and adopt a list of qualified broker dealer uh, authorized to engage in investment activities for the college on an annual basis. Ms. Linda Patterson, if you will, please. Thank you. Yes, the broker dealer list, as Mr. Garcia said, is a statutory requirement. Um, we try to modify this as we as we see opportunities in the market and um, we're presenting this as the authorized list for this year. Are there any questions for Ms. Patterson and Mr. Garcia? If not, is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing our broker dealer list? So Move by Ms. Hutchison, second by Mr. Garza. Any questions for on that motion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Mrs. Patterson, thank you for your help. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. You too. Be careful. All right. Moving on, we'll hear our, about our co college's quarterly financial report, Mr. Garcia. Yes. I'm moving fast. Sorry. <laughs> yes, trying... yes. Uh, so I think everybody has a, in their package the financial statements, is that correct? So, yes. Okay, good. So we can get started. There you go. Thank you very much. So the financial condition of the college for the nine-month period ending May 2021 is stable in this current economic environment of uncertainty. There are downward uh, revenue pressures valued at $4.1 million that is offset by reduced spending valued at $3.8 million relative to the same period of the uh, of last year. I also want to point out uh, right here, can everybody see that? Let me make this a little bit larger. All right, so equipment here and computer software right there, those two line items. So I want to point out the reduced spending of approximately $1 million relative to the prior year during the same period in our equipment and computer software expense line item. This is attributed to the purchases made during the year with the CARES Act funding. We expect a similar trend to continue in the next a year due to the new HERF grant funding that we talked about earlier today. In addition, the college collect, collected from the CARES Act funding $2.2 million relating to our decrease in tuition and fee revenue for this year. This is reported at the bottom part of the report. Uh, let me see if I can scroll this down. It's so way at the bottom of this report. Um, it is reported there. Um, I believe it's under the section of, uh, of uh, yes, it, it's special items. Thank you. And so based on today's information, we are on track for ending the year with a surplus value at about $5 million, $5 million. If there are no questions, we will transition on to the balance sheet. Ah, perfect. Can everybody see that? Let's try this. Okay, good. All right. So, um, 
All right. So the college is well positioned to support the mission of the college and weather the current business interruptions with a cash and investment position of $77.3 million. The cash and investment position is sufficient to pay its current obligations valued at $13.9 million. Madam Chair, Mr. President, members of the board, this, if there are no con questions, this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions for Mr. Garcia? <coughs> Seeing none, is there action to accept the college's quarterly financial report? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Avert. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Hutchison. Any questions on the motion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Garcia. Um, actually, stay there, Mr. Garcia. You have one more item. Uh, we have a couple more items, actually. Yes. We have the action related to the adoption of order to conduct our public hearing for both the college budget and the tax rates. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so this statement is in relation to those two last items. The college is mandated by the state to hold a public hearing on the proposed budget and property taxes. Today's board action items is to hold a public hearing on August 24th on the proposed budget and proposed tax rates, details of the tax and budget information was presented in today's proposed budget update. Following the board's approval of these actions items today, the college will publish the date of the public hearing this Saturday in the Caller Times newspapers. Thank you. There is a uh, order uh, that will be uh, used for that purpose for the public hearing on the college's budget on Tuesday, August 24th at 11 a.m. via video, teleconference, and or in person. Uh, is there a motion to adopt that order? Thank you, Mr. Kelly, second by Mr. Garza. Any questions on the order, on that motion? All those in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign, that motion passes. And we'll move on now to the order to adopt, order for public hearing for the tax rate. Yes, ditto the first statement. Thank you so much. And that order is also in your packets. And I think there's also I'm so sorry. So yeah, there, this and this have to also be moved, the property tax rate, the increase of it, is ah. a specific language. Do you have that? Thank you so much. Yep. I yep. have it. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about I that. I have it. So there's that, and then there's the notice of the So there, there is a, um, so the hearing on the tax rate will actually occur on same same day, Aug Tuesday, August 24th at 1130 a.m., via video teleconference and or in person. And allow me to read this motion and then I'll ask someone to, to make a motion to that effect. A motion that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 0 0.283340, which is effectively a 1.29% increase in the tax rate. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Adami. Is there a second? Second, second by Ms. Hutchison. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, say, excuse me, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, for, uh, Mr. Rivera. I forgot you had that. Give me that cheat sheet. Uh, next, we are going to hear. We did both of them. We did the college budget earlier. I apologize. All right. Sorry about now that. we yes. need to have a motion for to call for a public hearing on the tax rate on August the 24th at 11.30 a.m. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Garza. Is there a second? Second by Ms. Hutchison. Any discussion on that motion? All those in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Thank you. It takes a village <laughs> to run a meeting. <laughs> Uh, next, we will hear from our um, ad hoc board bylaws uh, committee. Uh, Ms. Averett and uh, Mr. Rivera are going to um, <laughs> present to us the findings. I uh, want to thank Ms. Averett and Ms. Hutchison and Dr. Turner for your work. Uh, I know you've worked diligently over the past few months to bring these recommendations to us, so we, we certainly appreciate uh, that work. Thank you. If it's okay with you, I'll stay here and uh, Mr. Rivera will drive the slides from up there. Great. If, if that's okay. Do you want to make a few introductory comments while he's getting the Absolutely. slides set up? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I want to echo the thanks to Regents Hutchinson and Dr. Turner um, for their, I know I'm echoing, for their work on this committee. 
uh, but we couldn't have done it without Mr. Rivera, Ms. McDonald, Ms. Sanchez. Um, it, it, speaking of taking a village, it really did. But, but we met uh, regularly. We met eight times in the last four months uh, because we wanted to get in and out of this issue and move on to other things. We're actually a little bit ahead of schedule. I think originally we had talked about bringing this to you all in September, uh, but we were far enough ahead that we wanted to go ahead and bring it to you today. Uh, for discussion and possible action if uh, if you don't feel like you have enough time or um, discussion time today this certainly can wait a month if we need to in terms of action but we wanted to put it on the agenda just in case you were comfortable with it and wanted to go ahead and move on it um, what we did was and I'm not going to read everything that Mr. Rivera put together in the summary um, but what we did was we obviously reviewed our current bylaws. We reviewed a number of peer colleges bylaws and ethics codes, a number of them. Um, we, we reviewed a number of articles, case law, everything that Mr. Rivera wanted to uh, throw at us with glee as he educated us on this issue. Um, so we felt like we had, had lots of good homework to do and, um, and, and were able to do that. Um, what's in your packet is initially our existing bylaws, our existing separate code of ethics that we um, sign, then what we will work from is this redlined version and then following the redlined version is a draft that's a little easier for you to read without all the red lines in it um, th that you can see um, uh, see it in its final proposed form um, a, a couple of high level just summaries I, I'll point out one is as I mentioned we previously had the board bylaws plus a separate statement of ethics if you will that we signed every year after our ethics training we're proposing that we combine those two things and that we fold in the statement of ethics into our bylaws because there was a code of ethics section in our bylaws so it felt a little repetitive to have both of those so we have taken the elements that weren't in the bylaws added those to the bylaws um, and done away with that separate ethics statement and replaced it with a uh, much more concise, basically, recommitment to ethics that we would sign once a year following our ethics training. We felt like that was a little bit more efficient. Um, and then we have also added, uh, which I'm, I'm sure we will talk about, in addition to these, the bylaws and the commitment to ethics, a uh, personal disclosure statement. It's, it's a very... Um, a uh, simple statement that basically seeks for us to to file who, who we work for, where we get any occupational income, and any uh, boards, organizations, things like that that we may uh, serve on uh, just to be very transparent about any community connections or business connections that we might have. So, um, uh, speaking on a overall level two I will say that some of what you see in the red line version are just cleanups uh, we realized once we started digging into the bylaws that there were a few areas where we just needed to tweak a word here or there uh, such as you may know that we read our vision statement at every meeting well in the bylaws it actually said that we read our mission statement so we fixed that we took this opportunity to fix that and um, and, and, and I will say, too, that some of the suggestions that are made, we are fully aware that it goes beyond what may be required of us through state law, but we wanted to take this opportunity to propose uh, a pretty robust um, code of ethics and one that, that uh, Mr. Rivera often said may be aspirational in nature, even though you know we're well aware that there may not actually be a a specific penalty if if some of this uh, this conduct isn't followed so um, with that I'm not sure how much everybody has had a chance to go through it we tried to get it to you as early as we could um, and and what your pleasure is on how to go through it I, I would not recommend that we go through it line by line because that's what we did and that's why you had us as a committee however certainly if there are some of the larger sections that are, you know, a little bit more um, substantive in terms of proposed changes, then we certainly, I think, should have some discussion about those areas. 
Um, let me just mention too that we did rearrange the bylaws a little bit um, in a in a way that seemed to make a little bit more intuitive sense to us in terms of how they were organized uh, when it came to board responsibilities and um, and our behavior as well. So, Mr. Rivera, um, if you'll go to the red line version and lem let me ask you and Regent Hutchinson, is there anything else that you would like to mention in general before we kind of get into the nitty gritty? Oh, maybe that, that's where we're going. I was going to say, <laughs> my only thing would be to maybe distinguish the things that were just clean up and those that, that there is some real substance that we think we struggled with and sure. now we want you to struggle with also. <laughs> <laughs> we, want, we want to share the struggle. Um, an easy way to spot the struggle are the larger paragraphs in red. <laughs> That's usually where we spend a little bit of time. And one of the new things you'll see right off the bat is a preamble um, that we're proposing um, at the very beginning there to kind of describe why we think that these things are important and um, just kind of as an opening statement to how we think we should con conduct ourselves as a Board of Regents. Mr. Rivera, do you want to add anything about the preamble? No, I think it speaks for itself. I think, and I think you've covered it succinctly but thoroughly <laughs> in terms of the work of the, of the uh, committee. You all had a number of meetings over the course of three months in order to meet your timeline, and you did a lot of study and a lot of homework, and there was a lot of input. So. Any concerns on the preamble? Uh, no. see an affirmation to Great. move forward on that Great. Yeah. thanks yes um, and again where you see just you know a couple of words those were not uh, necessarily large items of discussion for example the president I mean bylaws said president we corrected it to include a chief executive officer which is the official title so those are all updates were there any ma major changes to public comment? Um, I see that there's a lot of red there. Uh, could, could you maybe speak to that just uh, briefly? Sure. Um, is it okay with you, Dr. Virel, if we get there sort of chronologically? Oh, absolutely. That's yes, okay. Yes. And, I, and I'm not trying to go, like no, I said, no, line no. by line, but absolutely we will, we will talk about that. Um, Mr. Rivera, if you'll refresh my memory on under board duties and responsibilities, we have a number of paragraphs there that are in red. Those aren't all new concepts, but we moved them. Is right. that correct? That's why they're red. Right. right. You did some reorganizing. Uh, I think you included some new ones, added some things to clarify, but I'm, I'm trying to see if there were any. They're all, it's all in red, but I don't think there were any major. So let's talk, though, about section um, two, which is the statement of conduct and ethics, because there are some new areas there. And again, it's all in red because we moved okay. it from further back in the bylaws. However, if you will go to letter, sorry, lots of letters there. Letter W. Okay. Right, Mr. Rivera? I was going to point out F. Okay. You go to, to Roman 2, letter F. You, you all did add, you expanded that. That was. I to highlight that. Right. Right. During the bidding, solicitation, selection, or appointment process. We, we did have a lot of discussion about mm -hmm. letter F as it applies to applicants. Uh, for board positions and because this would apply to applicants for board positions and how we became comfortable with leaving the word applicants in is that um, because as we've we've talked about previously sometimes when we have a board opening somebody may call us and just say tell me what it's like you know mm -hmm. what is the time commitment that kind of thing that would still be um, allowed under this but once somebody actually files an application and becomes an applicant then it would be appropriate for us to say, I'm sorry, but at this point the process had started and 
you know, I'm really not at liberty to talk to you one-on-one -on -one now. So we're trying to avoid lobbying individual yes. board members? Yes, yes. Okay. I will say that I had um, conversations with a number of applicants during the process, answering questions about process and letting them know what to expect and, and, and even some how does the board operate kind of questions. So I think there would be, an, and we could certainly alter our process if we are faced with replacing a, a regent again to refer those kinds of questions to the board chair. Yeah. And again, if they haven't filed an application yet, that conversation would be fine. Yeah. Because well, I think some people do that just to explore whether they're even. But even really during interested. the process, I did have those follow-up conversations with folks, sure. and so I just wanted to. I think that I think that is necessary because it's not, it's not staff making that appointment. It, but I think there does need to be someone authorized on behalf of the board to be in conversation with those folks. Again, the difference between I guess lobbying and and. Um, being process oriented, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, should that be referred to, say, Augie, or would that be done by a member of the board? I think as long as as long as it's, we we recognize that there needs to be, and I would think the board chair is the place to do that, mm -hmm. because how does the board operate, and what can they expect from the interview process? Most of the formal communication goes through the um, goes through the the uh, our designee, whether that's Augie or someone else. Uh, but I think there there could be and should be an opportunity for clarification and those questions to be asked and answered. And this this paragraph does say out no communications outside of the established process. Right. Good. So okay. Could, yeah. I would read that to say if you're just describing the process, it's not, it's within the process. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Regent Aver, if you wanted to go to. Well, I didn't mean to overlook anything between uh, F and I was moving on down because the, many of these other paragraphs were basically in the bylaws are already or in our code of um, our ethical statement. I'd like to make an editorial comment that um, it, remember at the very first meeting that you all had, we pointed out that your the framework and a lot of the content that you had in your in your bylaws were very similar to San Jacinto College. Yes. So I mean, it was it was it was. I don't, we, 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 I couldn't figure out who came first, but you know whether we the prior board, you know, used theirs or vice versa. But San Jacinto College, which we usually look to, uh, just just see what kind of practices they have since they tend to have a good operation there. You you all had a very very similar body of content as well as organization so I would direct you to letter U yes because we did um, it says refrain from accepting or soliciting any gift favor or service that might tend to appear to influence them in the performance of official duties or that might be offered with the intent to influence their official conduct we added appear to influence them um, because I think it ultimately uh, originally had just said which is offered with the intent to influence because we felt like, well, the person offering the gift can just say, well, it's not meant to influence them. And so we wanted to have language that was strong enough um, that also discouraged us from doing anything that might appear to influence us in any way. It's still a subjective standard. Sure it is. And we discussed that, and we we talked about dollar levels and some things like that, but but ended up with this sort of general, mostly just a question of would would some reasonable human being think that you were being influenced or attempted to be influenced? I'm guessing a variable there would be the relationship between the board member and whoever whoever's soliciting. If they're long-term friends, and they go to dinner like they normally do, mm -hmm. is that meant? To That's be permissible. Like, yeah. That's actually in the, in the law. You can, it has to be a long established relationship. Yeah. But even then, I mean, I think you, you all talked about that, how even that sometimes you've got, you just got to be careful. It's mm -hmm. So letter W is a new 
um, letter for us that we discussed, we've discussed for some time now and discussed at our board retreat. And um, <coughs> this is the language that we, <laughs> we haggled over. <laughs> okay, so this looks like the um, language to avoid becoming a um, lobbyist to the legislature, that type of thing. Um, but here, th this does seem broader. Taking employment or entering into the business with any vendor contract or company. Currently, okay. <coughs> not that, not that it would, uh, not that it would be an issue. But give me, let me give you an example. For example, I work with school districts. Uh, say a school district wants to hire me for my consulting, um, and then two or three months later, they want to create a partnership with Del Mar um, uh, for, for some sort of program. H how would that? I think you'd be prohibited from doing it. Under this, under this so language, yeah. Any school well, district that we're currently working with on dual credit, I, right. I guess you'd be prohibited from working with it. Let me be clear. I mean, that's something you will have to decide. I mean, these are ethical right. principles, not legal ones. State agencies right. do have, uh, you know, revolving door provision that's for two years, you can't do this. I, I don't know how the Board of Regents could enforce this. I don't know and they, they, they I, I really don't have, I, I just use that as an example because that's one that currently, good I currently it work good with example. school districts mm -hmm. that are, that's current. I don't necessarily see something in the future, but you just never know. I just thought I'd bring that up. The, the other thing, I, I, I appreciate where you're going, but, but the business relationship is a, is a um, there could be two sides of that. I have relationships with companies that contribute money to Del Mar College. Would you consider, and, and have, because of my service on the board and my public relations profession, have been able to bring those companies and enter into contracts to to be part of our contract services to contribute to the college. Um, I haven't used well. I haven't used my influence for anything for Del Mar College. I've used my influence with them <laughs> to get them to contribute. But that would could that be considered a business relationship because they entered into a workforce contract with Del Mar College okay. that's benefited the college. It's, it's benefited the college. It hasn't, and it's benefited my client, well, but it hasn't cost the college anything. So I think that's why I'm saying it. I think there's a definition in business relationship that might need to be clarified because there's degrees of a business relationship that would definitely be to the advantage of Del Mar College for those to be encouraged. Well, I'm looking at it and thinking, so one of our vendors or contractors needs a divorce and hires me. Am I prohibited um, as a current board member or for a year after from taking that individual on as a client? Yeah, so I think what we're trying to prohibit, and, and maybe this language doesn't do it, um, is a former regent within a year after leaving Um, going to work and benefiting financially from an entity that has a contract with Del Mar College. Is that accurate, Augie? I think that's right. Mm -hmm. Maybe may the language is too broad. In advance, right. Right. Which is laudable, but not, this is very broad. Mm -hmm. I think that bears more scrutiny. So I, I, I agree that the goal should be achieved. How do 
we get there with that. Yeah. Yes. We right. can work on that. Right. <laughs> Good points. Mr. Rivera, you can work on some additional oh, sure. language there. Okay. Not a problem. And Bill, if you've got some language. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Not right off the top of my head. <laughs> right. It's tricky. Yeah, we worked on it this for four months. This is one that we worked on quite a bit, actually, <laughs> and discussed over several meetings. So, so I says draft on the top. Right. <laughs> okay, good points. We'll talk right below there. It talks a little bit about the statement of ethical conduct personal disclosure statement. We'll talk about those in more detail when we get down to those, if that's okay. Um, we, we put in the bylaws, and we've had some conversation about this recently, just to make sure that we use our Del Mar College email as our official tool of communication. Felt like it was important to have that in here. The social media language really did not um, change much. Again, it was moved, which is why much of it is in red. Um, and, and we are keeping an eye on some legal cases there as well uh, that Ms. Rivera will keep us apprised of that, that may change this for us in the future. There's a free speech issue involving uh, community college regents that's before the U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. it is. So section V, conflicts of interest and prohibited benefits. Much of this was in our previous bylaws. Um, we talked about this section quite a bit too. The whole $50 under 1A was, was already in what we had. And it's statutory, I think. Yes. I think it's just a restatement of the statute. I think in number four where it says we'll sh we shall avoid a conflict of interest and the appearance of such a conflict, I think we added appearance there as well. This, so this is the front end of it. This is when you come on to the board and you have someone that you had a, a prior relationship with, an employment relationship with, or uh, you know, that you should um, avoid participating in any, any matters like that. Don't, you know, don't vote on something that comes before you for a period of one year. Maybe that, sh maybe that is the way to, to resolve a couple of these is actions that could come before the board or that require some, um, is there some action on behalf mm -hmm. of the college or the board that either needs to be disclosed or refrained from? Um, because if, if a school can enter into a dual credit and that just it's within existing policy and there's no, there's no, there's no action that the board's going to take. There's no role then there, for the region. That there's no role for the right. region. If somebody wants to come to Susan for advice on their wills and estates or to bill for family law, then there's no action that that vendor is going to come before the board related to that. So, so maybe those can be tied to action of the board mm -hmm. if, if something has to come before the board or um, be out of the ordinary in terms of contracts or something, contract extension, et cetera. I think that that potentially is the way to maybe resolve both of those issues is... Oh, and I, I think also, and we've already talked about it, that uh, we would be filling something out with information on what we currently do as far as our employment. But I would think uh, a, a legal document that has a conflict of interest um, identification of, of possible conflicts, mm -hmm. having that on file, and then making sure that if something is coming up, that we're, hey, you know, Linda, or hey, Carol, this is something you might want to step right. back from. That may help. And which I, th I like about the state law is it has very clear de definitions of disclosure, very clear definitions of uh, abstaining or refraining from, from voice or vote um, on, on those kinds of issues. Um, so I, I, I agree with you. My other piece generally related to anything that talks about Texas government code is do we need to say that, re replicate that information in these bylaws, or do we need to refer to 
Texas government code or Texas penal code so that if that changes, we're not constantly rewriting our bylaws. Well, you can say or subsequent. Um, or, or subsequent revisions, good yeah. point. Yeah. Okay. We, we talked about that. I, mean, I, I think that you all felt it was important on some of these to, to have a specific citation. I think Regent Turner also pointed that out. Question on the documents that we, we have to fill out. Will those then be public documents? That's our that's our recommendation that they and are public documents and that we even post them on the website. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and I haven't forgotten about you, Dr. Viriel. <laughs> we're, we're getting Scrolling. there. The region misconduct. I mean, you all have seen this before. It, I think we added some details, but it's it's pretty much the same. Um, <coughs> The same process that, that you all have utilized to investigate uh, issues. So under board member training, there really wasn't much new. We, we basically just tried to make sure that we included and captured what our current practice is. With, with some wiggle room in case the practice changes, not to paint ourselves in a corner. Duties of the officers. I think on the training, didn't we also clean up when it would occur? Yes. Yep. It wasn't following an election because sometimes there's not that election, right. it's an appointment, some things like that. Right. And again, committees of the board, um, again, just tried to clean up the language so that it did reflect what we have already decided and talked about. Okay, moving on to public comment and, and Dr. Villarreal's question. Yes, a lot of that is in red. Um, and Mr. Rivera, refresh my memory. Some of this was because of where it is and that we had moved it, but a, a, lot of, a lot of this information was not in our bylaws, if I remember correctly, and we felt like it was important to spell out the procedures in the bylaws. It was actually in our policy. Right. For some reason, we had detailed, in our we had detailed steps and, and protocols in our policies, but not in the bylaws, so the committee was rec recommended, decided to bring this over and recommend to you that you just include it in your bylaws. Well, the more procedures we put in the bylaws, the uh, more challenging it is to change those procedures if circumstances mandate as opposed to uh, policies. Same process would happen. By, it, it's a action item either to amend our bylaws or to amend policy. If, if there are policies that pertain to to the board and this public comment, given that it ha you're talking about it occurring during your board meeting, you would have to do the same with a policy. Okay. You'd have to. And on this one, we've got some salvation with number is it 11, where the chair has the authority to temporarily modify any of those rules. Right. Okay. Right. Giving your chair a big gavel there. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for the majority of the red, but I will bring your attention to maybe. So the, the next item is just the draft without all the red, so it's a little bit easier for you to read as you go through that, but then we have the statement yeah, the press <laughs> large. <laughs> <laughs> then we have item five is the personal disclosure statement. This is a new document that we'd like you to consider. Um, the original one we talked about was a little bit more complicated, <laughs> but we uh, simplified it and, and basically are asking for, this is something we would file every year where we basically ask each of us to list all of our sources of occupational income, you know, where we work, um, and then any outside 
offices, other positions we may hold with corporations, partnerships, trusts, et cetera. Um, again, this just has to do with transparency and um, so that the public knows more about us and um, you know it's out there on the record in, in case certain issues come before us as a board. Uh, okay, so or self-employed by the nature of the occupation, mm -hmm. you're saying by practicing law? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. It does, but no, we that was not the intent. So, well, so Augie, going to interpret it that way. Mm -hmm. right? So we'll work on that language because that's not. I mean, the idea would be you would list your law firm, period, not your clients. I trust you're making notes, Augie. Yeah. You will. Now, now that Mr. covers Rivera. your your income. Did you consider your liabilities? If if I have a liability to one of my vendors or one of your vendors for my house note, wouldn't that be important? We we didn't discuss that in the committee. I mean, a mortgage not from a bank, but from a company that's doing business. Sure. That's doing business, loaning you money to buy a house. If that happened, should it be disclosed? It's interesting. The city has that requirement. Your liabilities also be listed. Oh, okay. So to know who you owe. Yeah. Indebtedness is a, can oh. be a consideration for some. Augie, can you um, get a copy oh, yeah. of the city's requirement? I think well, we also need a date. And you can, your, your personal disclosure needs to be, everybody needs to be due on the same day if it's April the 30th or whatever it is, but whatever day we choose. It, it, it yeah. is, Regent It's Cuff, in the be, bottom. It'll be yeah. the date that you mm -hmm. can, after you complete the ethics update and training. Can but if we're appointed and well, they're elected, then they're right. going to be at different times. And I just think it'd be in order for uniformity, if it should be all at the same time so that there's a note going out by staff saying your personal disclosure statements are due on this time and then I agree and then I'll collect I think that I think that would be separate from the annual ethics training and within 90 days of being elected it's or appointed or on it's in there March 1st is that's it that's in there it's in it's the in bylaws there. ah yeah, gotcha we had that yeah. exact same mm -hmm. discussion gotcha. so, so it's not on this in form November, within 90 days will presumably fall within the range that you're going to have the ethics update and if you're appointed in July then under these bylaws, you will be expected to turn it in within 90 days gotcha. of being appointed. Right. And okay. then catch up with And, and then, then catch, catch up. up. Right. Okay. All right. Yes. Good Makes point. Sense. Okay. Thank you. So liabilities, is that? I mean, I think I'm, I'm certainly open to um, looking at the wording that the city has to see and have some discussion about whether we want to include well, that. Just say, for instance, I've got a mortgage at Navy Army Credit Union, and all of a sudden Navy Army wants to have some don't do some training over there at some reduced amount. I mean, maybe I shouldn't vote on. I, I just use that as an example. I, I right. don't owe Navy I'm open. I mean, any money. I think that's a good point. <laughs> I mean, I, the example that Ed gave, I get. Right. Um, but you have a standard mortgage with a standard bank that does something with Delmar that somehow creates a uh, ethical. I think if you sit on their board, that's one thing. If you just got a mortgage with somebody or a car loan or something else, I don't know that that has to be <laughs> just an account, right? Yeah, with a lending institution that right. is in the business of lending money, and so I think that I think there is a. The, I agree with you. The example that Ed gave would be out of the ordinary. Yes, <laughs> we can certainly look at that. Right. I think we should look at the yep. city's language and see. Yep. Yep. See and what that I, I says. I think theirs comes from the state. To be honest with you, it's a state yeah, yeah. ethics right. requirement. State, state. So state 
agencies have, like the 30 page. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rather lengthy. It's this very is lengthy. Brief, so I like this. But <laughs> so we could, could we link it to the possibility of a, of a conflict? Relationship with Doma? I mean, if so I owe my brother in law. $500, I don't have to list that. That's Good not. point. It has to be disclosed <laughs> and included for any pending or current okay. vendors. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, yeah, so you know. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That, that, <coughs> you're making it relevant and you're not just having to identify okay. it. I am certain the college does business with a lot of people that we don't know about. Right. That's, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> And then uh, finally is the um, statement of ethical conduct, which basically takes the place of what we sign now that just affirms every year that we've reviewed the bylaws, we've completed the ethics update that Mr. Rivera does for us every year, and we have filed a personal disclosure statement. Um, I, I want to piggyback on something Mr. Kelly just said about I'm confident we don't know everybody that the college does business with. That's true. And, and part of our discussion that we had in the committee meetings, um, I shared a, a couple of experiences I had, particularly early on as a new regent, where um, I was a little naive a few times um, when, you know, somebody reached out and asked me to go to coffee. And here I am thinking it has to do with my business. And then about, and, and the person never mentioned Del Mar College, but it became clear to, you know, about halfway through the conversation, I'm like, oh, he, this person doesn't care what I do for a living. This person suddenly cares because I'm a new Del Mar regent, you know? And so I, um, um, and, and I don't want to speak for Dr. Turner, but we were talking about having a pretty robust ethical code and bylaws, and that's why a lot of things are spelled out, so that it's sort of our um, blueprint, if you will, you know, for um, what we can and can't do, and, um, and just r reminding us all every year that, yes, we're a relatively small town, yes, a lot of us know a lot of people, and no, we don't want to interfere with long-term friendships, um, uh, but at the same time that there are business people out there who, you know, want to have access to us because we sit on this board and that, you know, we need to be careful to um, still have those friendships, but when it comes to Del Mar business, keep those at arm's length and not be afraid to say, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you about that. And I think there is a, there's a balance as elected officials between responding to constituent communications and, and concerns of the business community, individual concerns, and, and, and we've all dealt with it, whether it's students or faculty or business people, and that balance in between hearing and receiving that information and acting on it inappropriately. So that, that's what I would be a little concerned about is, and, so, and I think you've, you've threaded that needle pretty well in, in, in some of these comments is that that you are going to refrain if there's an active bidding process um, and, and and you've talked in here about referring information to the president and CEO and, and, and others so that's just that's that's the the thing I want to as elected officials it is part of our responsibility to listen and respond or listen at least and then to refer or and or respond where appropriate um, and that's that's a hard balance, but we have that's that's why we're here. It's so whether whether you're elected or appointed, that that same that same issue applies. Isn't it our job to reflect the mores of the community, or the desires of the community, what kind of college they want? I mean that that is going to require us to listen to people. Right. Well, sure. But it's how we act on it. So uh, as right. opposed to giving someone preferential treatment in a contract. Right. Well, I think we, what I hear today is that there's a couple of places where we need some additional language. Yes. Um, and so, and, and I would um, ask that if anyone after this discussion has other thoughts, that you communicate those to either Mr. Rivera or uh, Regent Averett. Please. And, because um, I, I guess we'll have, we'll have, bring this up again for possible action at our September meeting. Sounds good. 
Anything else for today's meeting that we want to highlight or discuss? Let me just add very quickly, once we do adopt uh, whatever draft that we do, we will request that the board um, and the chair allow us to meet a few more times just to harmonize our policies with the bylaws. We didn't really get into the policies because we didn't want to spend time doing that until we had the new bylaws in place, just to make sure that the policies support what we do adopt for the bylaws. Sure. Thank you. And just one, one final note, because I, I want to, because Regent Scott's point is a very good one that, you know, it is a balance and you have to, and, and you obviously have to be the eyes and ears of Del Mar College. You're the personal representatives out there, so you're going to be hearing things and you, you can't say, don't talk to me. You need to know concerns, but then you need to know how to appropriately refer it or channel it. And, and I think you all will do that. And I think this document gives you better guidance for that on how to do that. The other thing I wanted to say, just about the personal disclosure statement, as Regent, I'm glad Regent got us appointed it out because the state, I think they are picking on their, on their, on their, on, on the folks that are with state agencies. I mean, it's 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 onerous. It's a very detailed disclosure statement. What I know from working in this and other situations is, that you also have, I mean, because you are a public official, does not mean that everything about your lives is open book. It, it shouldn't should be. be. And, and so that's the balance that the committee, I want you to know that that was discussed, that it was how much is enough to be transparent and to be useful, but how, you know, let's not cross the line and make everybody feel like, gosh, I don't want to serve, I'm going to have to, you know, so those issues were discussed. I just wanted you all to know that. Great. Thank you again for your work on this, and please, uh, well, I'll, I'll communicate that to Dr. Turner as well, but thank you so much for your work on this. All right, then, with no action on that item, we'll move on to item number 12, which is the discussion and possible action related to the approval of the recommended college-wide rebranding options. Dr. Escamilla, would you like to introduce this? Yes, ma'am, I would. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Regents, uh, we have before you your consideration of, of approval of an item um, that has been bubbling at the college for several years. Um, but as, as Ms. Williams has, has uh, joined us in the past, you know, two and a half all right almost almost, almost okay we're getting close okay <laughs> I, I was in the ballpark but it, 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 in, in that neighborhood this project um, which is an incredibly important piece as we move forward so for so many reasons uh, is an opportunity to advance the college's um, brand name uh, reputation all of those things um, in in a in a very um, I think in an outstanding way. I want to, before we get, before I hand this mic over, I want to thank uh, Ms. Williams and the team, uh, the team being people from all over the community, people uh, from uh, all over the college who came forth and did some incredible, incredible work uh, with the help of, 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 our, of our firm, of our marketing firm out of San Antonio, AG, um, what are they? AMG. AMG, yep, yep, AMG. Um, Anderson Marketing Group. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yep. Okay, brain's working now. <laughs> okay, so it's uh, it's it's my it's my pleasure to 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 introduce this topic because it's gonna it's gonna be a process um, that I think will um, should it be approved it will take um, several years to fully saturate yeah. um, and so I want everybody to know that but I want to again thank Miss Williams and her team uh, her team's efforts for for putting forth I think a stellar uh, process uh, by which we have uh, generated this report for your consideration. Ms. Williams. Thank you, Dr. Escamilla, and good afternoon, Regents. At this time, I would like to present the final options and recommendation regarding the college's rebranding initiative. All right, so the college-wide rebranding process actually kicked off last December when we made our first presentation at a board workshop. So this entire process has really taken around eight months to reach the point that we are at here today. So for today, I'd like to spend a short time just reviewing the actual process that we use to narrow it down to the selections that you're going to be seeing a little bit later on in the presentation. And then we're going to review our focus group results followed by the presentation of the naming options and those associated survey results, the mm -hmm. logo options and those survey results. And that's going to lead us then to the final recommendation and then, of course, board action. 
During the December 2020 workshop, we reviewed the Southside Campus Communication Plan, and that included four phases. In phase one of the plan, we discussed the need to develop and finalize a college-wide rebranding process. We discussed this need to complete the process by the end of this summer so that we can move this plan into phase two. Here we have the overall goal of the rebranding effort, and that was really to implement a process that was inclusive of campus and community stakeholder feedback, resulting in the adoption of an updated college logo and sub-brands for individual college campuses and our educational centers, with an immediate goal of focusing specifically on the sub-brands for East, West, and then, of course, our new Southside campus. So there were four objectives that we defined focusing on campus and community engagement, campus branding, college branding, and then of course the establishment of a timeline to complete this entire process. In line with objective one, the college held a series of virtual focus groups which included online surveys at the end of each of these sessions. We had over 134 employees attend eight internal sessions that were offered between March 23rd and the 25th, and you can see all of the groups there that were represented on your screen. And for our community partners, uh, stakeholders, and the general public, we held seven sessions that were offered. We had 35 people attend those sessions, and additionally, one-third of the attendees submitted written feedback as part of our follow-up survey process. Objective two really focuses on the development of the parameters for these sub-brands. These are all in, in compliance with board policy B3.7, and as you can see there, B3.7 states that campuses and complexes shall not be subject to naming recognition or naming rights, as those collections of facilities are better reserved for geographic, functional, and related descriptions. So that's why you're not going to see any of the options related to individual names. Rather, the focus is going to remain on geographic, functional, and the related descriptions as described by the policy. Objective three focused on the update of the college's logo to reflect a contemporary and forward-facing brand. This includes the update of the college's t logo and the tagline. It's not going to include changing the name of the college or changing the college mascot name. One of the first things that Dr. Escamilla did was establish an employee advisory group to assist uh, with this rebranding process. And the purpose of this group was to represent the DNC employee voice. Specifically, the group's role included ensuring both the historical and cultural context of the college was considered throughout this entire process. They assisted with guiding and directing the refinement of the names. Also, this group of employees periodically reviewed and provided feedback on creative concepting that was developed by Anderson Marketing Group, and they serve as the college's agency of records. You can see all those listed there, and I would uh, like to personally thank them for their time and commitment, and of course their invaluable feedback and direction in this process. I was really hoping that some of the members of the committee might be able to attend today's meeting, but under social distancing guidelines, that wasn't possible. So Dr. Escamilla wanted to make sure that their voices were represented. So I have included a few quotes from three of the members uh, of the group, from Dr. Mark Robbins, who is a history professor. I'd like to read his quote. It was truly an honor to serve on the rebranding advisory group. We had the opportunity to collaboratively reflect on Del Mar College's rich heritage and exciting future as we considered a range of possibilities for a new college logo and campus sub-brands. I'm grateful to have been a part of these important conversations about Del Mar College's historical and cultural prominence in South Texas and about how the Del Mar College brand can most effectively serve the college's many stakeholders in the Coastal Bend community for years to come. And from Amy Jones, our speech professor, as a former Del Mar College student, 1992 to 94, and a faculty member since 1999, it was an honor to be involved in the rebranding process. The end product, I believe, represents a thoughtful collaboration of Del Mar College colleagues. I also hope it is a blending of our college's history and our future. And then, of course, from Brian Stone, our history professor, 
He says, it was a real pleasure to participate in the rebranding discussion as a member of the committee, and I felt that the college relations staff did a terrific job presenting the various options to the committee and encouraging us to weigh in freely. We had detailed, thoughtful conversations, not only about how best to represent our college in the future, but about what Del Mar College means to our community, both on and off our campuses. It was a fun, useful, and interesting discussion to be a part of, and I appreciate the chance to participate. So once again, a huge thank you. I asked them to submit, and you could see they sent some very passionate uh, information in, and I did want to be able to share that with you. We really appreciate what they did and how they invested their time. All right. So objective four really focused on the establishment of a timeline. We talked about that inclusive of the stakeholder feedback, the creating, creative concepting, and the final approval by you all. So what you have here in front of you is the rebranding roadmap. That dates us back to January of this year, and it took us all the way through April. I'm not going to go through all of the activities, but I wanted to share this with you as a means of illustrating all of the meetings and activities that have taken place over the last several months. And then you can see here, this is the roadmap from May through August, and which is a culmination of all the activities concluding with our final presentation that we have here today. I would like to take a moment to say a few words about Anderson Marketing Group. Uh, I mentioned them earlier. <coughs> AMG, they currently serve as the agency of record for Del Mar College, and their main role is to assist with our marketing campaigns that are produced prior to each semester. Additionally, they played a really big role, a huge role, with the creative concepting and the final designs that you're going to be seeing coming up here a little later in the presentation. And I'd also like to take the time just to thank the entire college relations staff. I know that you mentioned that, uh, Dr. Escamilla, but specifically Monica Cruz. She serves as our college's creative services manager. Uh, lots of time and effort on this one. So I, I just wanted to pre appreciate them for everything that they've done and what they've contributed to this overall process. All right. At this time, I'm going to present the two final choices for naming options for the East west and the south side campus so how did we actually get to this point after considerable discussion and brainstorming the naming conventions that we came up with were narrowed down to three primary focuses we had geographic suggestive and associative so geographic uses a landmark or a geographical reference this is a very popular choice among colleges and universities Suggestive is uh, simply suggest what the business is or what it does. And associative is a naming convention that pertains to or is resulting from some type of association. So we actually reviewed 14 different names in all to get us to the final six options. And then, of course, the three names that we're going to be recommending today. So here is naming option one. These names, uh, these options are an example of highlighting individual names and how they might live together versus fitting it into a thematic group or naming convention. So in this case, Heritage is a name that gives credence to the legacy of the East Campus. And for the West Campus, Windward represents direction and can easily connect the college to providing direction. Also, a well-known fact, uh, if you've been out to the West Campus terrain, you know it's pretty flat and it's pretty windy. <laughs> Oso Creek for the South Campus lives within a geographical reference. So option one includes names that highlight each of the campus's individual attributes. So option two. Option two has a strong family resemblance using Spanish words for coastal attributes of Corpus Christi. This group also supports and works well with the origination of the Del Mar College name, which of course when translated is of the sea. So for East Campus, you have Bahia, which illustrates the direct association the college has with the Corpus Christi Bay. For West Campus, the option is Lantana, which is a strong showy, showy shrub that's pretty abundant in our area. And then for the South Campus, you have Laguna, which is associated with a shallow body of water that is close to the coast. So these two final sets of naming options that were narrowed down from the 14 options that we shared with the focus groups 
were then sent to all of our employees for a final vote. And I'd like to share the results of that survey with you at this time. So 463 employees completed this survey, which was open for about three weeks in June. And so for the naming options, we had 364 employees vote for option one, which includes Heritage, Windward, and Oso Creek for a total of 79%. And then we had 99 employees vote for option two, which was Bahia, Lantana, and Laguna for a total of 21%. So you can see pretty clear here of uh, the employee choice. So now I would like to share with you the two final logo options. Um, these options were reviewed by the president, the rebranding advisory group, and then it was also forwarded to all the employees for this final vote. So here we have logo option one. This includes a design uh, that makes use of negative space to help visually separate the acronym while the topography kind of modernizes the look and feel of the logo. This, of course, here is shown in black and white. We'll get to color here in just a minute. Option two may feel a bit more familiar to you as the agency incorporated that legacy wave mark from our current logo while modernizing it in this concept. The wave also continues to provide a nod to our coastal location Anchoring the acronym onto the wave provides a subliminal connection to the sea. So this is logo option two. It's going to lag a little there. All right. So once again, the logo options were included in that survey I mentioned. It was sent to all the employees in June, and now I'd like to share the results of that. As you can see here, a total of 463 votes were counted for this portion of the survey. 51 employees voting for option one for a total of 11%, and 412 employees voting for option two, a total of 89%. So as you can see by the numbers, we've got some very strong results here when it comes to the logo of choice. Anytime that you undertake a rebranding process, this also is going to include an updated color palette. This palette was presented to the rebranding advisory committee and the president for review and approval. And what you will see here is a refreshed palette uh, of blues to a more modern coastal hue. We also have a bold coral red that is going to replace the yellow accent that's currently used. Each campus will also have its own accent color that can be used for campus specific events, programs, signage, that sort of thing. And I'll share you uh, some examples of that here coming up. All right, so at this time, I'd like to present our final recommendation, recommendation for board approval. Based off the numbers, uh, the numerous rounds of input, the discussion, the feedback, we felt that the following logo option and the naming options best represent the new forward-thinking brand of Delmar College. These selections strongly align with the survey results received from our employees over the summer. So now I'd like to show you some various options of the recommended logo choice in color and examples of how that might look in practice. So this slide here illustrates the various versions of the logo and how it can be used. The top logo features the logo icon, the college name, and a campus name in the appropriate colors. You can also see how we can use this as a standalone icon, coupled just with the campus name. And then the third variation includes a slightly different formation of the icon, college name, and campus name. So what I'm showing you here is this gives us a lot of flexibility with signage, marketing, and apparel. And here you can see how the recommended logo looks in ads and on certain promotional items. And that coffee cup there kind of illustrates that new coral accent color that I was mentioning earlier. 
This is another ad version that illustrates how we can customize the look by campus. So for example, uh, this would be a bus bench ad on the Oso Creek campus. You can see it says Oso Creek campus. I really like this. I think this best illustrates how the color palette complements each other. The first flag is an example of a DMC flag, which can represent the entire college. The second flag would be representative of Heritage Campus, the third, Windward Campus, and lastly, you can see there, the Oso Creek Campus with the coordinating colors. How to get this one in here. <laughs> Here's just another example of how versatile this logo is. The Board of Regents title nestles perfectly into the C of the college icon. Um, this will allow for certain programs or departments, et cetera, to customize and establish their own identity while remaining true to our brand standards. And lastly, we have a number of projects currently under construction and remodeling on the horizon. So I thought it would be appropriate to share some samples of how the new logo and colors might look on exterior signage. The first rendering is an example of a structure that you typically see at the entrance of a campus or as a center, port, center point of a landscaped area. The flag on the light pole, that's pretty self-explanatory, um, but really does assist with the branding of a campus and identifying spaces that are indeed part of that campus. That also kind of goes back to that coloring that we talked about. And the last illustration is an example of outdoor directional signage. I wanted to outline a few next steps if the board chooses to approve this recommendation. Once final action is taken, we would move very quickly to complete the DMC style guide, which will provide direction on the current usage of the logo along with the branding guidelines. Finalize the implementation procedures and a timeline and update the spirit symbol and our official college seal to align with this new brand. Then in September, we would be implementing a tiered priority system for purchasing items with the new logo and rebranding. So the system would include three tiers, um, with tier one including items that are of highest priority, um, things that we can replace, or items that we can easily update with little to no funding. And I think digital when you think of that, pretty easy. Um, then, of course, Tier 2 would include items that should be replaced and can be absorbed within our departmental budgets. And then Tier 3 items are items that can be replenished as needed. I want to point out that we realize it will most likely take several years to implement the new colors and logo campus-wide, um, but we're definitely prepared for it to be a process and not something that's just completed overnight. We know this is going to take some time. So at this time, I can take any questions you might have, um, and then I can hand it over to Chairman Scott for further action. Thank you so much, Loretta, and thank you to your team uh, and for everybody involved in the process. Uh, this is a great overview, and I, I know that our new regents appreciate uh, hearing a little bit about the process and what you all have been through in the, in the last year working on this. So congratulations on some good work. Are there questions or comments from board members? I think it looks good, and I think the survey results do indeed speak for themselves. <laughs> all right. Um, don't... Don't take the lack of, be happy with a lack of questions. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> were, um, to what extent were existing students engaged? I saw the survey of faculty and employees. Yes, they were included in the focus group discussion. Okay. And so your action, uh, the action requested of us today is to accept the report from the uh, branding process and to approve the new rebranding package as presented. Is there a motion to that effect? <laughs> Dr. Adami made the motion, Ms. Hutchison seconded that. Any other comments before we take a vote? Yes, Dr. Villarreal? I think it's outstanding. I mean, outstanding, classy, uh, really, really professional. I think it's forward moving. I think it looks, it looks to the future. It just represents some really outstanding work. I mean, outstanding. Thank you. Very excited. When, when you first embarked on this, I was somewhat concerned about getting away from our 
geographic descriptions, which what we used to joke east and east of where and south of where and what we, <laughs> what does that mean anymore? So I think you all have done a great job in in helping uh, to to now overcome that obstacle and, and give us something really fresh to start with. Ms. Hutchison, I just say I, I love the results, but even more important because this is not my area, of, you know, of, of expertise is I love 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 the process, and yes. I feel very very confident about that. Madam Chair, may I say? Absolutely, sir. Th this approach, um, I think minimalism was the kind of the theme, kind of the uh, methodology that, 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 that said more, you'll get more with less in the long run. And so I really, really appreciated that approach. The other thing too, from a color standpoint, I purposely wore this today um, because of this presentation and this will be a uh, collector's item, I guess. <laughs> um, as long as it fits me, I guess. But anyway, um, the, the, the colors were very, are very thoughtful and so forth. Um, the blue and the gold, we believe, belong to our brothers and sisters down the highway up there <laughs> at your alma mater. Um, there is some, there is some sharing of that color that we thought was gonna, it was gonna do all too many, too many things unintentionally. And so uh, we move, moving away from the blue and the gold, as pretty as it is, um, it was uh, out of our due respect and love for, for your alma mater. Uh, by the way, um, so just those two points. Thank you. I, I do want to ask a, a quick question that I think I know the answer to. So normally these rebranding processes, uh, bringing in consultants, and there's there's a, a lot of money spent on this. Uh, tell me what your uh, what your out of pocket was on on this process. The creative concepting was between twenty and twenty five thousand. So you did all that process day, work intern. You did all the process work internally. All process work was done internally. Yes. Um, what you're seeing of the twenty and twenty five is actually the creative concepting piece of that, creating the logos and the assets that they'll be delivering to the college. Wonderful, because I, I know that there are com there are entities in town that have spent yeah. upwards of six million. I mean, excuse me, six figures, maybe seven figures on on this process. So so good job, good job. Thank you. With that, uh, all those in favor of approving the new rebranding uh, information package is presented. Please raise your hand. Thank you. All those opposed, same sign. Congratulations, unanimous approval. Yay. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Appreciate it. Good work, good work. Good work. Excellent. All right. Uh, item number 13 is a discussion of possible action regarding deactivation of our Associate in Applied Science and Electrical Transmission and Distribution Systems Technology. Dr. Halcom. presentation up here. Is it there? Okay, there we go. Um, we constantly analyze our programs through our program review process, our advisory committees, and departmental self-analysis. The Department of Computer Science, Engineering, and Advanced Technology reanalyzed their, um, their program of the Associate of Applied Science in Electrical Transmission and Distribution Systems Technology degree. They are asking to deactivate the degree. They presented this to the curriculum committee in February of 2021 where it was approved to deactivate. The program had only six declared majors in the 2020 to 2021 academic year and zero graduates. There was much effort put into recruiting, but they still could not get the enrollment high enough. The faculty, chair, and dean recommended the termination upon approval and the creation of a new advanced technical certificate to be offered through the instrumentation program. The industry advisory board worked together to develop the advanced skills certificate and a majority were in favor of deletion of the AAS degree in electrical transmission and distribution systems. And they wanted to implement, of course, the advanced skills certificate. Deactivation of this program does not affect the faculty teaching load within the computer science department because those faculty had previously left, uh, they had resigned or retired. So the students will migrate then those six students will migrate to the Department of Industrial Education Instrumentation Program, and upon completion, students may continue in the Advanced Technical Skills Certificate Program. 
Students in the program can apply and obtain a dispatcher apprenticeship with AEP through APEX systems. The courses would be taught primarily by faculty in the instrumentation program. Upon your approval for deactivation of this AAS degree, our next steps are to notify the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the SAC COC. Now, should you have any questions about students transferring to an advanced technical skills certificate, I do have Dean Davis Merrill here that can answer questions about that. Uh, do you have any questions about the deactivation that I'm asking you of? I do. Yes, Mr. Kelly. Listening to you, it sounds like what we're doing is um, changing the program so it's more in tune with what the employers want. Yes, the advisory committee did advise uh, our faculty that it was more in line to do the certificate program. And, and apparently yes. most of the students interested in this area recognize that and didn't yes, sign up for the course we had. Yes, that's my understanding. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that's all I had. Any other questions? Is there a motion to approve staff recommendation to deactivate the Associate in Applied Technology and Electrical System Transmission and Distribution Systems Technology? Uh, I'll make that motion with the understanding that we're migrating the students to a more relevant program. Thank yes. you, Mr. Kelly. Second? We are. Mr. Garza makes a second. Any questions about the motion or the pre presentation? All those in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. And thank you, Dean, for being with us. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have a discussion and possible action related to the AGCM contract modification. Dr. Escamilla. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Stravos is going to take on a topic that, that uh, I present to you, uh, um, some, some, uh, some information that, is, that has received uh, a lot of attention from, from our staff and our team. Um, it, it is a, uh, uh, we are at a time, in a time or at a place in, in, in our history on the south side that we are turning the corner on completing um, the largest of, of the buildings or the first of the buildings, which is the STEM building, uh, which is supposed to be uh, turned over to us late next spring, early next summer, with the idea that we can actually begin teaching classes uh, in that building uh, as soon as summer two. Uh, maybe even summer one with some good luck um, on, on some smaller levels. The idea is then to be to begin ramping up and, and, and moving towards completion of the entire campus so that it's handed over to us in its entirety. To do that, um, our team um, must be um, fully staffed and, and enabled uh, to do that. And I've been working with Mr. Stribos to make sure that that is the case as we move into um, um, these critical next, um, I think a total of 18 months or so yes, for, for, to, for, total, for total turnover to us. Um, these days, uh, what we're seeing out there with, with, with various groupings of, 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 of whether it's a construction team, a maintenance team, and so forth, there are enough issues, items, and availability. You, we heard today from Linda Patterson how, how you know, there are plenty of jobs out there and not, not enough resources, not enough people um, necessarily to fill all of these uh, jobs that are out there to, to do constructions and maintenance and all of these other sorts of things. Um, and so as such, you know, and, and then not to mention the things that are going on with, the, with, with COVID-19 and then the resurgence of the Delta variant and those guys, all of these factors, all of these factors are things that we weighed. Um, as we uh, put together, as, as I am supporting um, um, Mr. Stribos and putting together um, this presentation for you today, it's a very serious one. I've I've not uh, um, I've I've cautioned everybody to say with whether it's IT or uh, physical facilities um, or instruction that you have the ample workforce in place because there's too much uncertainty. Uh, in front of us. That being said, I turn the microphone over to Mr. Stribos, and I, know I will answer any questions as you all need. You have an action item, and uh, you have the amendment. We've got a I have a presentation that uh, part of what we'd committed to bringing back to you was a uh, review of the AGCM contract. I'll go through this presentation, and I know you've had a long day and seen a lot today. Um, so I want to start with just some acronyms. Uh, it's the a construction alphabet, if you will. 
uh, with higher education. We never stopped learning. AIA is the American Institute of Architects. CM is Construction Management. CMAA is the Construction Management Association of America. PM, Program Management. PMI, the Project Management Institute. TEC, the Texas Education Code. So you're familiar with some of these. And uh, with all respect to the legal counsels in the room, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not giving any kind of legal advice on anything <laughs> that I'll talk about today. Just scroll up the page. This is an IT challenge, right? <laughs> All right, so what is construction management? It's a professional service that provides a project owner with effective management of the project schedule, the cost, the quality, safety, scope, and function. Construction management is compatible, is compatible with all project delivery methods. No matter the setting, a construction manager's responsibility is to the owner and to a successful project. And that comes from the Construction Management Association of America. What is program management? A program is a group of related projects managed in a coordinated manner to obtain benefits not available for managing them individually. Program management is the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to meet program requirements. That comes from the Pro Project Management Institute. And I've put these because we use these terms interchangeably, and they mean about the same thing. So why use a construction management firm? The construction, man firm, construction management firm uses industry standard practices to manage projects successfully. They have six areas of knowledge, schedule, the cost, the budget, safety, quality, function, and scope. They provide a level of expertise that may not be available from the current staff, and that's very clear, and that's part of why we've been using them, and that's a key reason why we've been using them. It allows flexible outsourcing, staff augmentation, strategy to staff major programs and respond to business objectives on the basis of the project workload and an, an ability to contract with the best qualified firm that fits the program's requirements as part of the owner's team and being able to manage the construction management firm directly through the end of the program, which is what I'm doing. How these bond projects have worked out, Del Mar College is the owner. We have architects and engineers that we've hired through in accordance with the law through the Texas Education Code, Chapter 2254, Professional Services. We have a general contractor. We hired through the Texas Education Code, Chapter 2269, Contracting and Delivery Procedures for Construction Projects. And then we have our construction management, which we treated as a professional service. So everything's been done in accordance with the state law. Background on overall construction management fees. So the American Institute of Architects has a standard form of agreement for almost everything. I haven't found something yet, but they'll find something. They have an Article 10.1 on compensation for the program manager's basic services described in Article 3. The owner shall compensate the program manager as follows, and it basically is a laundry list of different methods. They're not specific on that. When you break it down, they have four different primary methods as well as other different methods, nine different ways that the construction manager's fee can be calculated. The Construction Management Association has five different methods, a cost plus fixed fee, a lump sum bid, negotiated fixed fee, a percentage of the construction contract, and time and materials. A study from the Construction Management Association is from 2014, so it's about seven, eight years old, depending on when they gathered the data. The range is quite a bit on these, from lows of 2.7% up to 7.4, 9.4, 10%. Broken down by different delivery methods, different roles, different sectors, different markets. So it gives you an idea that the range across the country is just all over the place. Some notes on the study. The fees have a lot of variability. The overall average was 5.6%, 5.6%, and from 2007 they were saying they were down. Now, again, that's a dated study, and when you look at the Construction Management Association, they're vested in construction management how the compensation is calculated. Even if it's time and materials, that's labor rates times labor hours, which is so many dollars, which translates into some percentage of a construction contract. If it's a percentage of a constru construction contract, that's so many dollars, which is labor rates times labor hours. So we can fall into a trap of debating about which way to do it. At the end of the day, with all respect to the math faculty, they'll say these equations are identical, and they really are. They all tie back together to labor rates and labor hours to get dollars, which are percentage of the contract. Del Mar and how we selected AGCM, RFQ 2015-14, 
Qualifications only, no fee. Seven firms submitted. There were 12 members on the evaluation committee. AGCM was ranked the best as the qualified firm. Their fees were then negotiated on a time and materials basis using labor rates and labor hours. In looking at those original contract awards, the labor rates, the labor hours, and how that tracks out, and again, this is going back to an original award on January 5th of 2016. So this is five plus years worth of work. And by the time we're done, we'll be getting close to seven years worth of work. So it's a lot of work that's gone into this, a lot of labor hours. And that's for 2014 and the 2016 bond. Current analysis of all of their projects broken down on the 2014 bond <laughs> projects and the 2016 bond projects. You see some pretty high percentages, especially on some of the 2014 bond projects, but the weighted average for all the projects ends up being around 3% of our construction costs. If you plot that on a map, it's a lot of numbers using uh, a bandwidth. And I pick these numbers, I put 3% in the middle, 1.5% is the green line, the black line is 4.5%, kind of just a range of values to show you that the majority of these plot within this bandwidth. And this is kind of representative of what we see across the industry, across the U.S. So we are within the bandwidth. <laughs> Where we are today, the current contract award for all the projects, 2014 and 2016, $6,497,294. Invoice through July 31st, $5,997,459. These are remaining balance at $519,834. At their current staffing rate, that leaves us five and a half months, and we've got 13 months left to go before everything's totally complete. The total construction amount, including the change orders, and this is for the South Campus, right at $118, $118 million, and that does not include the next agenda items. Projects are about 70% complete. We are uh, working on tour for all of you uh, coming up soon. STEM and culinary arts buildings, we're looking at substantial completion about February 28th. After they're substantially complete, then we do all the rest of the heavy lifting. We move in all the furniture, pictures, equipment. The building's wired for IT. We have to bring in all the computers, all the other elements to get it ready. We're targeting potentially a soft opening in the summer of 2022. Then the main building's complete August 2022. Students in seats January of 2023. The critical activities that are left and the responsibilities, the ongoing construction management from AGCM. Construction Administration Services, Gensler, the architect, and Turner Ramirez, their sub-consultant. Construction Materials Testing, Rock Engineering and Testing, Building Envelope and Testing Commissioning, Command Commissioning, and then everything else is going to be Delmar College, the purchasing, physical facilities. The faculty are almost getting tired of having meetings on these projects, but I think they're really looking forward to moving into the buildings. What are our next steps? You have an action item to increase AGCM's contract by $400,000 and to extend their contract through August 31st, 2022. And that will allow their staffing level to change and keep the adjustments so that we will have adequate AGCM staff on site through the remainder of the project. We'll continue to use additional third party testing and physical facilities personnel will continue to do their jobs. And so that brings to the action item that you have in front of you, asking for a recommend an increase in HECM's contract of $400,000 and extending their contract through August 31st of 2022. Questions? Thank you, Mr. Strybus. Are there any questions? Yes, Mr. Bennett? Your original request was for 600000 a couple of months ago. Yes, sir. It's been reduced by a third. Yes, sir. How'd that happen? Uh, I sat down at a table with them about once a week since then and kept negotiating with them to a strategy, a staffing level that could fit within our budget constraints and yet still deliver the services that we need. Mr. Bennett, I'd like to add to that if I may. Sure. When, when we were given the original number and, and uh, uh, of that $600,000, uh, uh, John and I sat down and I said, look, we, 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 have, we have just a few choices to uh, not move forward to 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 add to it or subtract from it i mean we had we, we, it was just it was just it was really simple i said so get down to it find out what we need take a take a 12 month snapshot in time i said and 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 i asked him frankly i said 
uh, would you and, I, and, and negotiate the best you can and put the sharpest point to that pencil, but don't jeopardize, don't jeopardize quality and or losing the the amount of help necessary. So we sat down um, together. He did that. He he moved forward as he said. I, I had nothing to do with those negotiations or anything else. But I really um, held um, uh, Mr. Stribos. Um, um, to to these details and the and, and, and the actions that it, and, and and the decisions of this board, and so you can see there's a significant reduction. Um, I think we're gonna, um, you know, I'm, I've got to listen to him. He is a uh, he's a certified engineer, and uh, um, uh, I just want you to know that uh, we 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 heard um, um, you all's voice uh, here at the board. Another question I've got. Uh, this is. It looks like it's covering two hundred nine million dollars. My research has shown that the larger the project, the lower the percentage. Am I incorrect on that? I think you can find sources that support that. I think every project is unique and different. I think that's a general rule of thumb that can follow that. But I think we're to place a snapshot in time, if you will, that what we need to do to get this project completed to the best value of the taxpayers and Delmar College is invest another $400,000 in AGCM. I think in the future, Delmar does another bond. We look at this and we can set these strategies and these plans in place. Yeah, I, I, I'm just concerned that it's twice what, what my research shows. You, you get 3% so far and my research shows 1.5%. And that's a big number in dollars. Yes, sir, it is. I, I agree. So basically, are there any other alternatives other than providing them with another 400000 Well, there always are other alternatives. Some of them just may be less palatable than others. Uh, the desired outcomes may not be in our best interest. That, uh, for example, the next item that we'll talk about in a little bit is another change order four items that need to be completed, and I have a list where I'm projecting again in September and again in October to bring forward another series of change orders. Part of what AGCM's direct responsibility is, preparing these documents, being sure that everything's done correctly. So it could put at risk the work needed to complete the project, the quality and what is demanded of the project. So, so there's no real viable alternative? There are viable alternatives, yes, sir. Um, that. Uh, we could hire staff within Del Mar to pick up this load that the staff we've got is fully overworked already, but we could hire program managers and project managers to do that. There's a cost to doing that as well, as well as the time to do that, working through the human resources part of it. And, and could that exceed the 400000 you're asking for? Potentially it could when you talk about hiring top flight project managers and knowing that they would basically be working for approximately 12 to 18 months which uh, when you hire staff like that, uh, having been through some of that and knowing it's not going to be a permanent job, the first thing you're doing is looking for their next job. Sure. And they're spending more time looking for their next job than working for Del Mar. Well, I, I'm uncomfortable with this, but it's sounding like there's no real practical alternative. No, so not, not at this point, not this stage in the project. If we were two years ago, we could do things differently. But where we are today, uh, the goal line's in sight, and we don't want to drop the ball on the way to get there. I'm uncomfortable with it, but I understand. I've heard you loud and clear, sir. Other questions or comments from Mr. Stravos? Yes, sir. Um, from your analysis, um, what have they saved us? I mean, we have a um, contract manager. What did we get? Um, did we get a better product? Did we get a less expensive product? Um, what did we get? So the construction costs are driven by the market and we have a contract with Fulton so we haven't gotten a cheaper or, or lower cost product. What I think we've gotten is a better quality product and it stayed on schedule and time is money. Mm -hmm. That every day the contractor's out there working and he's supposed to be working but at some point it starts to cost the contractor in Del Mar more money. So by keeping the contractor on task, it is saving us money by keeping us on schedule. Okay. And we are getting quality product out of the project. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Strabos? 
There is a staff recommendation to approve contract amendment number three in the amount of $400,000 with a funding source coming from the 2016 unallocated interest income from that bond. Uh, is there a motion to that effect? So Thank you, Dr. Adami. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Averett. Any other questions on the motion or the presentation? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Strabos. Now on to item number six, no, item number 15. Last item. So this item is asking for approval for change order number four on the South Campus in the amount of $622,186. It's funded from unallocated bond interest income. This item specifically includes stem building fume hood plumbing line verification for, and then all the building, exterior light fixtures, all buildings, miscellaneous framing, stem building, reverse osmosis water for glassware washers, culinary arts and main buildings, electric door hardware, the main building, missing floor drains and sinks, main building bulletin zero, number seven from the architects, STEM building, bulletin eight, miscellaneous request for information, culinary arts building, kitchen equipment, which is the main item, $212,000, and I'll give you more information about that one. Also, all buildings, duct chase enclosures, which is required by the city of Corpus Christi, culinary arts building, multiple purpose room doors, STEM building, etched windows, acid etched windows. So the culinary arts equipment was a result of meetings from bulletin 10, incorporating changes and additions to the kitchen equipment and added utilities to support the changes. Routing the conduit for the soda system, a credit for metal panels and ceiling changes in the teaching restaurant. Major changes include change of the stand mixers, and these are items identified by the faculty. And these are changes from when the project started to how they plan to be teaching in a year. Additional blast chiller has been added, triple deck oven model changed, the proofer cabinet was changed, the addition of a dough press, change of marble tops at workstations from wood, the chocolate tempering machines changed, special mixer has been added, refrigerated display case has been added, a proofer added, and credit for removal of a grass, gas grill. And so that's the background for the, uh, the largest single item in that change order was on the kitchen equipment. And then we do have additional change orders that we project for September and October which is going to include a variety of items. Uh, primary one will be the water feature will be added in, that they've been pricing that item, getting additions to it, and we have a variety of items um, that have come out from that. And working to get all those completed and prepared as soon as possible so that they're not delaying any of the construction. And that's one of the key roles that AGCM is providing, is shepherding these through the system. Questions? Other questions for Mr. Stravos? I have one real quick. On yes, sir. A change order for the water feature. Don't want to run into the same issues we've had with the city and the and the uh, water garden. Uh, can we make sure that whatever design they come up with, that it's going to be a maintenance friendly can, feature? May I jump in there, John? <laughs> Regent Garza? I could not agree with you more. <laughs> I, I just had this conversation this morning with yes, John. Sir. I said, this is, I, I call it the water feature. This is not a water fountain. There will be a pump. Uh, that's 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 very different. It's a, this, this this for circulation purposes, right. and it's very different than projecting water and making a display. You know, it, it is a functional pump that will circulate and keep clean uh, to certain standards and levels um, um, uh, the, the water. And so, um, I I know I I told them I do not like water features. I don't I, I don't get me wrong. I, I I can see beautiful things. I can appreciate it. But this is a functional water source that would also could also be used for watering. Um, okay, that's another question for another time. But <laughs> I don't want to get too far ahead. But but it's not the same thing um, for the same purposes um, of of. A purely aesthetic it there, there's a lot more function that yeah comes I, with I'm it. just concerned about sustainability Absolutely. that's all yeah okay sorry I just any other questions there's a recommendation from staff to approve change order number four in the amount of six hundred twenty two thousand one hundred eighty six dollars uh, funding source would be the bond interest income is there a motion to that effect mm -hmm. thank you mr. Garza is there a second second, second by dr. Villarreal any more questions all those in favor please raise your hand any opposed same sign that motion passes unanimously Thank you very much, Mr. Travos. Thank you. Thank you, staff. That was a packed agenda today. We appreciate it. Appreciate your reasons, reasons for all of your uh, attention today. We are adjourned at 4.40 p.m.